Being that time, I will call the uh, Town of Wolfboro Board of Selectmen meeting for May 17th, 2017 to order. Mr. Owen, do we have a need for uh, non-public tonight? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we have a matter of uh, real estate to discuss. Okay. Uh, we have the minutes of May 3rd, 2017. I see that uh, Jim Collins of the American Legion the d get reports the dates given for the National Police Week in the selectmen's meeting minutes are in error. He states that National Police Week uh, this year is actually May 14th through the 20th, 2017. Correct. Are there other corrections to the board? Make a motion we approve the minutes. I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Any other discussion from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. We have uh, two public hearings tonight. The uh, first public hearing is for a temporary outdoor event permit, Morning Star Lodge number 17, to hold cross country races and fun races on July 13th through the 27th, 2017, on Thursday evenings from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., starting at Abenaki Ski Lodge. Is there someone here to speak to that? So my name's Christina, I'm the race director. Um, I'm gonna be helping the Masons hopefully host this fun event. Um, I have five years of experience of hosting several races throughout the state, um, ranging in distances from one mile all the way up to 50 miles. Um, one of the things I firmly believe in is leave no trace, working with landowners and making sure that people aren't littering, going to the bathroom, no swearing. Um, everything needs to be polite and obviously, um, you know, being nice to other users on the trails. We like to try to promote a nice, healthy environment. Um, the Cross Country Series is something similar to a series I created at Northwood Meadows several years ago. Um, started with just a vision of bringing families together, getting people away from the television, video games, and all that stuff. Um, I wanted something that would invite not only toddlers, but also everything from slow runners to fast runners to first time runners. And one of the really wild things was it brought people together and created a lot of friendships, and over the years I watched kids go from the popsicle dash where they ran about 20 feet to a cooler of popsicles and grabbed the color they wanted, to running the one mile race, to running the full three mile course on their own. Um, it was just really cool to see, and every year the event would grow. I actually just ran the course tonight, um, put together the one mile course and the three mile course. The trails are they're absolutely beautiful. I think we can um, do something really nice for the community. The idea would be to mark the course at five o'clock at night. I had talked to the um, Lakes Region conservation people and they don't want permanent markings up there so I'll have to mark it before the race and then I'll have to have the flags pulled. Um, kind of a nice thing about that is I'll send out a course sweeper after the last runner goes and they'll just pull flags behind that person which also ensures their safety and makes sure that they get off the course. Um, the, Popsicle dash, basically throw out a cooler of popsicles, toddlers come, it's free, um, just say go, they run, you give them their popsicle, they're happy as a clam, and you move on to the next race. Um, the one mile event is for anybody that wants to do it. Um, you show up, it's very well marked course, you follow it, come back to the finish, people can walk it, they can take as long as they want to do it. Um, realistically, the longest it would take is about 25 minutes. Um, the three mile race, I would start that about 25 minutes after the one mile race just to make sure that everybody's off the course and um, accounted for. The one mile race is not timed. I want to create a stress free type environment so people aren't worried about how long it's taking. Um, the three mile course, a little more intense. I'll again make sure that it's marked very clearly. My one concern when I ran it tonight, there's one section on filter bed road. I'm gonna need two volunteers. I don't know if you guys want us to have a police officer there or if we're okay with just having two volunteers to point people off the trail onto the road, run down the road about a tenth of a mile, take a right onto the trail, and then they would be following flags again. Um, typically, I prefer to use surveyor flags. They're easy to place. I put arrows at key intersections. Um, and again, I do have a course sweeper that goes out. I generally don't get people lost on the trail. Um, <laughs> It would be a pretty hard course to get lost on anyways. 
Um, of course, vandalism does happen, so that's definitely a concern and another reason that I'll have a couple of volunteers out on the course in key places. Um, I've had some people reroute a course and that's not a, a good thing to have happen, so um, safety is definitely the biggest concern. You should have received the insurance. Insurance, no. Okay, they said they faxed it yesterday. Um, I'll follow up with them. We have a million dollars in coverage. If you need more, we can get more coverage. Um, take a look at what they have when they send it. I actually have a copy of it on my phone. I can pull up and double check and see what we have. You know, I guess the biggest thing, because it's a fundraiser, we'd be given $2 a person to the Lakes Region Conservation. They do maintain the trails. They, they did ask that we give them something, and I think it's only fair. Um, the Freemasons would really receive the rest of the money. I know the lodge is usually rented out. I don't know if we would be able to just use the lodge for the bathrooms. You know, we're trying to not spend a lot of money. I can spend money on porta potties and, you know, have those delivered there. It's cheaper to just drop them off and leave them for the three weeks than it is to have them come and, and get them. But whatever works best for you works for us. And at the last race, um, ideally a potluck. People just bring some sort of their favorite dish. We have a um, big event grill. We cook hot dogs, burgers, and you know, just try to create a really fun event where we give people series awards at the end and you know recognize the the series winners. And I think that's about it. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Dr. Neal can answer all the stuff about the lodge. I can't answer that. So I'll open the public hearing. Is there any members of the public that uh, have any questions or want to speak to this? Seeing none, I'll uh, close the public hearing. Board members? My only thing is I had noticed <clears throat> that it was not the insurance, and <clears throat> I think we require a million dollar. Yes. I can pull up the policy right now. I, I didn't uh, see the uh, insurance policy come in. Yeah, they said it. I have a copy of it right here, and I can show it to you. But I, I was out of the office for much of the okay. afternoon, so I might have missed it. <clears throat> What did we do before the internet? And as for the bathrooms, I think that you'd have to talk to Christine Collins on, I believe okay. the bathrooms I think you are you could open. just make it uh, uh, conditional upon the receipt of... Uh, In terms of the bathrooms, I thought the bathrooms were open to the public, you know, for if they went cross-country skiing and stuff like that, and they, <clears throat> that, that, can, that uh, facility can be gated off. So those yes, bathrooms, um, I think we just should check with. We can uh, check with Parks and Rec. Okay. But I would think that they would be open, okay. from my understanding. And in terms of volunteers, I think if volunteers can. Volunteers are fine. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So it's $3 million general aggregate for the insurance. Um, each occurrence, $1 million. Damage to rented premises is $1 million. Um, personal and advanced injury, $1 million. And products. Um, Comp, OPAGG, I'm not sure what that is. That's $3 million, and each occurrence is $10 million. I don't know if that's sufficient. Okay. Oh, yes. And I'll make sure they get this over to you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I entertain a motion to, uh, to approve that pending the, just, the re just the receipt of the uh, insurance certificate. I'll move to approve the issuance of a temporary outdoor event permit to the Morning Star Lodge 17 to hold cross-country races and fun races on July 13th, 27th, 2017, Thursday evening, evenings from 5 to 8 p.m. starting at the Abenaki Ski Lodge, contingent upon the town receiving their insurance policy. So the second that. Motion has been made and seconded. Any other further discussion from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Next, we have an application of the uh, Wolfboro Historical Society for a permit for the sale and consumption of beer and wine at the Clark House Museum Complex for an event on July 15, 2017, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Good evening. My name is <clears throat> excuse me, Louise Horskin, and I'm president this year of the Wolfboro Historical Society. Every year we have speakers uh, come through New Hampshire Humanities programs. And I discovered a speaker right 
among us here in Wolfboro. I could not believe his credentials, and that's Glenn uh, Knobloch. And um, he speaks on brewing in New Hampshire, an informal history of beer from colonial times to the present, from home tavern base to our present day microbreweries. He's the author of 15 books and over 100 articles. Some are Northern New England, Bridges, uh, Nor New Hampshire cemeteries, and African American military history. He holds a BA in history from Bowling Green State U. He is the manager of Rite Aid. <laughs> so <laughs> when I got his script, I was like, he's right here, right in our midst. And I thought, we have, we have two new breweries uh, in uh, Wolfboro, one on either side of me. <laughs> And I was telling, I do not drink beer, so this is not for my benefit. But I thought it'd be good to feature them and to introduce them to the community. And they are the Lone Wolf, which he has a place down at uh, Center of Wolfboro, is Graham Combs, and the burnt tin, uh, timber is Eddie Meechno. After the talk, now the talk will only be an hour from uh, three to four, and then after the talk will be the sampling of their beer and the selling of their beer. No wine will be, and that's my drink, uh, we'd be sold. Uh, Dave has all of the insurances and, um, and the riders and the liquor licenses from both companies. Yes, Louise just provided me with a uh, revised certificate of insurance that includes the liquor liability Writer. Right. Okay, I'll open the uh, public hearing. Are there any members of the public that uh, wish to speak to this or have any questions? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, board members? Yeah, I noticed that the uh, State Liquor Commission's uh, license for Brunt Timber Brewery runs out on June 1st, 2000. And, oh, that's okay. Never mind. No, it is. It, it, it expires on no May thirty first, two thousand and seventeen. So that needs to be updated. I believe it. And now, now whose liquor license was that? Uh, Brent Timber Brewery. Yeah. And and he, there's a revised copy that Dave has. We, and it goes and to eighteen. Okay, updated one. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That's the only thing I saw. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> well, I, I start small with everything that I do. I start small and hope it expands. Does the board wish to make a motion on this? I'll make a motion to approve the issuance of a permit to the Wolfboro Historical Society for the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages, beer and wine only, at their Brewing in New Hampshire event at the Clark House Museum Complex on July 15th, 2017 from 3 to 5 p.m. I'll second that. The motion's been made and seconded. Uh, any other discussion from the board? Being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Next, we have the uh, bulk vote, which includes weekly manifest, property tax abatements, refunds and denials, property tax credits and exemptions, notice of intents to cut lumber, timber, current use application, yield and tax levy, real estate warrant, tax warrants. Entertain a motion to accept the bulk vote. So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Appointments, uh, Fisherville Committee, uh, Mr. Owen. Well, uh, initially I thought we had one or two people to appoint here, but apparently we, we don't. Uh, what I would use this opportunity for is to uh, pass out some information here. Uh, the hi highlighted uh, uh, positions are the v remaining vacancies on the various boards, and of course you know about the Fisherville Committee. Uh, we ha also have a take an alternate position on the Agriculture Commission. And 
We also have a vacant position on the Heritage Commission due to a resignation. Um, so um, that's where we need volunteers yet. So any members of the public on t are watching on TV tonight, you know, we still have these vacancies. At, uh, Wolfboro is an active community and, and vibrant area, and it's because of the people that spend so much of their time and give so much back uh, here in Wolfboro. So uh, if you have an interest, you know, uh, please contact the town hall, and uh, we certainly welcome uh, people to fill these positions. Mr. Chairman, I thought that at the last meeting that Mr. Harriman uh, also uh, wanted to be on that committee and that so we should list him as a second selectman. Am I correct, Brad? Yes, yep. actually, on Fisherville. On the list there. Fisherville, yep. He's listed there on listed the there. list that I have. Yep. Oh, he is, sorry. Yep. Yep, he is. I guess I thought he would be down as a selectman. Right. Well, it was appointed as a member, as I understood it. Okay. Next, we have a new business. Uh, Monthly budget expenditures memory report. Pete. Good evening, Pete Chamberlain, finance director. Uh, at this particular point in the year, we should be at about 33% expended to date. So you'll notice um, quickly running down through the general fund is about 32.5%. Water fund at 35, the electric fund at approximately 31, the sewer fund at 49, and pop whaling at approximately 40%, with a total overall at 33.387. Uh, uh, again, the sewer fund and pop whaling are front loaded with expense during the first part of the year due to uh, debt service and an operating schedule. So um, I've uh, Included my comments as usual. Uh, are there any questions on the expense portion of the report? No. And as you will notice uh, in the attached revenue report, that revenues for the general fund are sitting at about 42% this year. That's good. I have a question on the revenues. Sure. Um, I noticed that the Pop Whalen Arena is only 17.83, and I was wondering if most of their funds come in um, in September and October, and that's why we see such a small number there, here. There's a receivable from the prior year. Uh, they bill out their the uh, ice time invoices at the end of the year, and they will receive them and during the first couple of months in the following year. So there were probably, I don't know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of revenues that were um, charged off to the prior year. Okay. So in October they'll start picking we'll up. We'll start again. seeing a big in the fall we'll and see. We'll book the receivable at the end of this year at, at the end of uh, uh, okay thank you. That's what I thought. December anyway. Any other questions from the board? No. Are you doing the loan agreement with the uh, New Hampshire Municipal Bond? Yeah. I can. This is the uh, boilerplate uh, wording for resolution for the uh, issuance of the $550,000 Winton Neck Road uh, bond from the year before last. As you know, uh, the bond sale in the fall of 2016 was canceled, moving this up to June the 6th of this year. So this is the standard uh, verbiage that required by the uh, bond council in these matters. Okay. You want me to read it? We need to read this to the record. It, it needs to be voted exactly as uh, in right. the motion. Uh, you could move just to uh, uh, approve it as written or however, if you want to. I think that. Having to read it. 
I think the public might be interested to know that the interest rate is 3.75. Maximum. Maximum. Yeah. Max. Do you want to read it? It's two pages. Okay. This, uh, this is the loan agreement, uh, word by word, uh, verbatim resolution. Resolved that under and pursuant to the Municipal Finance Act, Chapter 33, NHRSA, as amended, the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank law and to a vote of the issuer duly adopted on March 8, 2016 under Article 4 of the 2016 Annual Meeting, there be and hereby is authorized the issuance of a $550,000 bond of the issuer known as the bond, which is being issued by the issuer for the purposes of financing the cost of the design and construction of Witten Road water line improvements. Resolved. The bond shall be dated as of its date of issuance, shall be in such numbers and denominations as the purchaser shall request, shall mature in accordance with the schedule set forth in Exhibit A to a certain loan agreement hereafter described as, quote, loan agreement, uh, shall bear a maximum interest cost rate as defined by the loan agreement of three and three-fourths percent, that is 3.75 percent per annum or such lesser amount as may be determined by a majority of the board. The bond shall be issued in such a manner and form as the signatories shall approve by their execution thereof. Resolved, that the bond shall be sold to the bond bank at the par value thereof, plus any applicable premium. Resolved, that in order to evidence the sale of the bond, the treasurer of issuer and a member of the board are authorized to direct, directed to execute, attest, and deliver in the, same, in the name and on behalf of the issuer a loan agreement and substantially the form as submitted to this meeting, which is hereby approved with such changes therein not inconsistent with this vote and approved by the officers executing the same on behalf of the issuer. The approval of such changes by said officers shall be conclusively evidenced by the execution of the loan agreement by such officers. Resolved all things heretofore done and all action heretofore taken by the issuer and its officers and agents in its authorization of the project to be financed by the bond are hereby ratified, approved, and confirmed. Resolved that the clerk and the signers of the bond are each hereby authorized to take any and all action necessary and convenient to carry out the provisions of this vote, including delivering the bond against payment therefore. Resolved that the useful life of the projects being financed is in excess of 21, parentheses, 21 years. Do you want a motion? Motion. I move that we approve the uh, bond as read by David Bowers. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any other discussion from the board? Not all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have the lease agreement with uh, renewal for the Wolfboro Cooperative Nursery School. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, Selectman Murray and I met with the representatives of the nursery school. Here we go. This is uh, K Casey Rogers, I yep, believe. Casey Rogers. Uh, and um, uh, worked out a uh, uh, extension of the lease agreement and uh, I think uh, it's relatively unchanged with a few exceptions and uh, those exceptions being that we bumped the, the, the rent payment up uh, $10 a year per month um, and that's included in the, the rent schedule you see there and then um, also uh, they informed us that they had uh, to uh, seal the, the floors down there mm -hmm. each year and that they were footing that cost by themselves despite the fact that you know the it's the town's facility and we're basically responsible for the maintenance of the facility. So we uh, agreed to incorporate language here that uh, uh, we will split the cost of sealing the floors each year between the town and, and the nursery school. And I think those were probably the major changes. Um, yeah. Anything else? No, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're agreeable with all the language that's in here and it's pretty much unchanged. Mm -hmm. Just a bump of the rent and 
the addition to help pay for the cost to seal the floors. And that's it. Does the board have any other questions? Make a motion to approve and sign the lease agreement with Wolfboro Cooperative Nursery School for a space at the train depot for a three-year term through June 15th, 2020. I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Any other discussion from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have an update on the Libby Museum, uh, the director, Alana Albee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the board for inviting me here to give an update on the Libby Museum. As you know, I'm the new director, just started the 1st of May, um, and I presented you with a brief about what we have been up to to date. I'll go through it just quickly and then propose a decision on the pricing structure for the Libby. So far to date, we have started by recruiting staff for the summer season, we're all set with that, and um, starting to feature a new logo and redesign to refresh the look of the Libby, including on the website and social media. We've um, published in the Granite State News one feature and we'll continue with features regularly. We have cleaned up the inside of the museum, which was um, in need of a lot of it ref refresh and are in the process of cleaning the nature trail and the town's been very supportive in supplying wood chips, et cetera, and Kingswood students will help with that as part of their community service. Friends of the Libby have also volunteered their efforts on that. Um, we are also planning a disguise for the porta potty that sits at the back <laughs> of the museum in keeping with the beauty of the museum. Um, and Kingswood has generously offered to build that for us at just the cost of the materials. We've started networking with other museums to get ourselves in line in terms of pricing and activities. We've met with the Boat Museum, the Wright Museum, and we're part of the um, New Hampshire Heritage Trail Museum. We're also planning to recite the large Indian that normally stands outside of the museum on, um, at the entranceway to its rightful place next to the trees just to the left of the museum at the beginning of the nature trail as um, it was actually done to honor someone who wished it to be there. Um, and we're talking with various contractors and the town about how to secure it. There have been theft issues as some know in the past, not of the Indian, mind you it's a bit big to steal. Um, on the summer activities, we're all set with the summer activities. We're continuing with the much-loved Little Sprouts program, which provides very young children um, with two days of a week. Um, that's its 23rd year. We'll be doing live animal shows um, with Squam Lake um, this year for nine straight weeks, and we're hoping to offer out a solid week of outdoor education for 10 to 14-year-olds in August. That's still to be confirmed. We have a guest photographer, fabulous um, guy, Roger Irwin, New England nature photographer, who will also feature at the museum in August and has allowed us to use some of his photography in our new um, refreshed look for the Libby. Some of you will have seen um, the Bobcat in the last Granite State News. You'll be seeing posters around town with that. We'll also be hosting local award-winning photographers, local students who won State of New Hampshire awards for their photography in, in July. We'll have a friend's reception and their annual meeting as usual. Um, in terms of the collection, and I want to emphasize here that the collection of the Libby needs a lot of attention and sadly hasn't had the attention it deserves in recent years. Um, some of the collection which was last assessed in 1999 is in quite a dire state, somewhat to do with the state of the building itself and the moisture issues. So we'll take the 1999 report done by one of the most eminent taxidermists in the country, Ron Harvey, and we will do an internal update of the state of the collection to determine whether we need to have Ron Harvey come back and do a full professional assessment or whether we just need to get strategic about how we restore some of the most valuable items like the passenger pigeon, which is now extinct, many of you will know, 
and rare maps, very fragile paper items, and some of Dr. Libby's own collection, which are in um, quite a dire state. You know very well about the building more than I do. I've only started the job on the 1st of May. It's excessively damp. Today was a first warm day inside. Um, the collection is being affected by the damp. The exterior paint is also peeling badly. Um, it's a challenge to paint the exterior. You know more about that as well. And some of the signage, including just as you come down the hill to the museum that says museum 200 yards ahead, is not legible because it's just not been kept up to date. So we have a lot to do. There'll be a moisture report at, with, from a consultant coming in June to the Board of Selectmen. Um, my decision to you tonight, uh, request for a decision, is about the pricing of the museum. We do not ha take credit cards or debit cards there, so just keep in mind the administration involved in um, this. It's quite um, traditional, I think is a nice way of putting it. Um, and we have been charging a dollar for um, children 4 to 12 and $2 for adults. That's far below the price point of other museums in the area. We're not proposing to go as high as, as others, the boat or the Wright Museum. We're just proposing a flat $5 for adult free to children because we'd like to see a lot of young people and children in the museum regularly. And we're also proposing um, free to veterans. Um, we were asked to consider that by the Chamber of Commerce. So that would simplify the management um, while keeping it within an affordable range. Thank you very much. Board members, any questions? I, I have one question. I looked at the income that the fees brought in last year, which was about $1,700. And I don't know if you know the number of adults you have and whether you've done any analysis to know whether you'll make that amount. Um, indeed, I did. Actually, by changing the price point from where it is with the numbers, because ironically, two-thirds of the visitors last year that paid for entry were adults. Um, it will double the income of, of the Libby with only going to $5 an adult and free to children. Thank you. I was hoping that that would be the answer. Thank you for that report, too. Very thorough. Uh, board, make, uh, I'll make the motion to approve the changing the admittance fee at the Libby Museum to being free to all children up to age 16 and to veterans, and that all other museum visitors will be charged a $5 admittance fee to the Libby Museum. I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Any other discussion from the board? Seek done. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much for the Thank report. Thank you very much. Mis Mr. Chairman, I should just note that uh, the Libby Museum will be back on your agenda at your next meeting because we're going to have a report on the facility by the uh, architect, and there'll also be discussion of a uh, new proposal uh, relative to the museum. So it'll be before you again when next you meet. Thank you. Next we have a capital products update report from Mr. Ford. Lou, um, you got your sheets there, I can follow along. This is now uh, extending seven years. Um, the first couple of projects were 2010, the water line, which is uh, money we've been holding to uh, supplement the Center Street project. Uh, we're going to talk about the Center Street project a little down the list, but that'll be incorporated there and spent at that point. Uh, the Route 28 study is, uh, uh, again, being wrapped up. That's the, the one we had started, and uh, we need to finish off with the stakeholders and looking at the alternatives for the uh, four intersections we're studying. The design of Pine Street is uh, being wrapped up, and that was going to be uh, priced out this summer and uh, brought to this, the uh, CIP committee to determine whether or not we put it forward for next year or the year after, and that would be the reconstruction of Pine Street and Crescent Lake Ave. The downtown street project uh, really is, again, money that's left over on a drainage, and that's for uh, doing some drainage work on the, uh, the ditch. We had hoped to try to do some this spring, but uh, the weather didn't work for us exactly right, and I excavated it didn't come until later. So we're going to wait till the lake is a little lower. We'll do that in, this, in the uh, fall. And that money also will be, again, uh, uh, in, co in conjunction with the Center Street project. 
Uh, this industry project, uh, again, was originally appropriated for $2.1 million. Uh, this year, we ad added an additional $543,000. Uh, that project has uh, come in, and uh, the bids have been awarded to GW Brooks. Um, we are um, going to be meeting with them um, next week uh, with businesses in the uh, Center Street area with the Paul Zimmerman's Plaza. Uh, we're, just, we're trying to coordinate the schedule. We have some very difficult work to be done in the parking lot there behind uh, Louis Pizza in the drive through uh, That's where the project will start. We're going to be talking to the uh, businesses about uh, starting it a little earlier, late, uh, mid, mid to late August. Uh, we talked about no stopping of traffic on Center Street until after Labor Day. Uh, so uh, we won't see a whole lot of activity. Right now, there is a lot going on. They're developing their stormwater management plans, and a lot of their uh, submittals are being done. Uh, we'll be doing test pits in the middle of June. Uh, certain things have to get verified, so we're going to be doing some test pits in June. And then, um, like I say, um, the drainage will probably start late August, and then the major delays and problems in the street will occur after Labor Day. Uh, and that's when the, the bulk of the work will be done. They'll be prepped and ready and, uh, and hit the ground hard and, and uh, do a majority of the work in the fall, and then come back in the spring next year, and then we'll shut down again for the, the summer, and then hopefully we'll wrap it up in the fall of uh, 2018. Uh, the sewer collection money also, we, we had money, uh, there are certain sewer uh, repairs that have to be done with this project, so that money is, uh, is earmarked for that project also. Uh, the next project, Libby Repairs, which is what uh, Dave just alluded to, uh, next uh, meeting we will have the report uh, from the architect and, and, and the architect here to explain uh, the problems with the ventilation and what they're proposing in, in a phased approach, so I'll wait and we'll, we'll talk that uh, in two weeks. Uh, sidewalk upgrades, again, we, uh, we had done some last year, and uh, we need to uh, complete this work, which is from the high school heading towards, um, um, heading south. Uh, some of the walks are in such bad shape, we had to rip up the pavement and just put some gravel down. Uh, right now, our priority is other projects, so this one is going to be put off uh, in, in because it's uh, in probably mid-summer uh, to late summer, early fall, we finish those up. Uh, the parking lot design has been completed, and uh, we're going to be going out to bid with that, and we have appropriated the money for construction. Uh, that project will uh, go to construction uh, mid to late October when uh, we're done with activities in the uh, dockside parking lot and when the lake uh, gets uh, get low. And so that'll be the best time to do that before winter hits. The uh, town asset management plan, uh, uh, tonight we're going to, at the uh, end of the meeting, we're going to be talking about the water asset management plan, and this is the first presentation, so that's a really good, um, and it kind of shows you um, the depth of these plans and, and how much money we have invested in our infrastructure and, and what we're going to be need to doing. We're continuing with the uh, buildings and, and the sewer system, and we'll have uh, additional um, reports uh, to present uh, later on this year. Whitneck Road, um, that project was substantially complete last uh, fall, but we still uh, need to do uh, a couple things. We're doing a little bit of drainage work on a section between Route 28 and the bridge. And once that is done, there'll be overlay in that section as well as overlaying all the section that was rebuilt, and that should happen within the next three or four weeks. Uh, the old railroad building, the only reason I kept that on uh, is we will be uh, doing the demolition of the, uh, uh, the, the con concrete containment uh, in putting in uh, gravel parking spaces there, as we, we, we talked about. We, uh, uh, by the time it was purchased last year, it was too late in the year, uh, and now that we have our machine, we'll be uh, in between projects, we're going to move it in, so hopefully within uh, two weeks we'll, uh, we'll be in there to uh, demo that um, concrete bunker and put some gravel in, so that'll provide some additional parking for the summer until we just determine what we're going to do with the, uh, the rest of the building. The 2016 um, road money is uh, uh, basically, the, the balance is uh, for Port Wetland, and then with this year's money, um, the contractor uh, lineman has mobilized, and they're starting doing the work. Uh, they're going to uh, do all the drainage work for us on Winter Haven, and then we're going to grind, uh, grind that up uh, and, and base pave that, and then we're going to overlay the whole neighborhood. Uh, that project's probably going to take four to six weeks, so that'll go into the early summer. Pleasant Valley Road bridge design, that was uh, finally approved by New Hampshire DOT. Uh, the engineer is starting to work on those plans and permits, so we'll be working out over the summer, the design and the permitting. Um, and um, I think nothing's changed since the last time we talked about it. It just took a long time for DOT to get it moving, so that's going to uh, start moving forward. Uh, the solid waste uh, building has been designed. We have the uh, uh, design um, 
about 75% uh, complete, and we're going to be pricing that. So when we come to the CIP committee, we should have a good uh, design and price uh, for, for next year's uh, capital projects. The treatment plant capital reserve, obviously that's 125000 we've been putting in each year. Um, we've already finished uh, some um, work in the influent building, some concrete repairs and, and flow meters that was completed. Um, we also have, um, we had the sludge building, which uh, collapsed under the snow this year. And we have that, but we're still waiting on the insurance to find out what the uh, claim will be, uh, what we'll uh, hopefully get, get from the insurance company. And we have proposals on, on, uh, on, on that building as well as uh, the sludge pumps, uh, which we hope to uh, execute. We just want to see how much money we'll have and, uh, and, and see uh, how many projects we'll be able to get done this summer there. Effluent disposal project um, is um, underway. We um, started, uh, I think, about three weeks ago. We uh, were down at the dock side and we're trying to fix the sewer. Um, we had everything planned out, but it uh, wasn't a good enough plan. We, we ended up um, losing control of the dewatering process. The water was coming in so fast and it was so uh, silty, the silt bags were filling up. And uh, because of the dirty water, we, we really had to pull the plug on it. Um, uh, and again, the lake was high, and we were being forced to do this because of DOT. Try to, you know, they wanted us to get that work done before they do their overlay. Um, so we did have to pull out, and we are going to have to go back in the fall and do that again. The lake is lower, and then we will have to have a um, we call a frack tank, so that when we dewatering, uh, we'll have a bigger containment to be able to handle the silt, uh, so we won't get any dirty water. We'll treat it all, and then we'll uh, we'll put it into the sewer systems. That makes sure sure none of that dirty water gets into the lake. The other big project is a uh, pilot four, uh, which is the um, again basically we're calling it a pilot, but it's really stage one of the long-term solution. Uh, we have our wetlands permits. We have an amended permit. Uh, the contractor has been selected. They're out working today. I've been out there with them, and um, will be uh, probably be a two-week process, and hopefully that'll all get installed and uh, that'll be online. We'll run it through the summer and. Um, Again, we've been in close contact with DES. If this is acceptable, this will then provide what our long-term solution will be for the effluent disposal uh, our project. And again, our schedule is uh, by the end of this year is to have that plan uh, the, and what it's going to uh, cost, uh, what it's going to cost the engineer, and the schedule for implementing that over the next two or three years. Are we uh, using those RIBs? How much are we putting up there if we are? Uh, right now, because uh, uh, we've had a pretty good year, last year we were only at um, 100,000 gallons per day, and uh, that's going to be increased uh, as things start to dry up a little bit. But right now, we're still keeping it there. We're probably June 1st, we'll increase it, and uh, we'll also be uh, also uh, we're, we're getting the uh, spray line set up. Uh, the pond is in a very good, safe position. We still have more than 50% capacity, so we're, we're in pretty good shape. The uh, wastewater asset management plan, um, we've got that paperwork all squared away with the state. So we have uh, the, the SRF loan, and they're going to forgive the $30,000 loan. That project, we already had a kickoff meeting. And the engineers, Underwood engineers, like you'll see tonight, will have a, uh, a similar uh, presentation uh, later on in the summer with that, that information. That project will be done by uh, September. This is also one of the requirements of the administrative order uh, mm -hmm. to have that asset management plan. The Center Street additional authorization we talked about already, that project moving along. And again, this year's road money, um, we are uh, supplement again, some of it's going towards uh, Winter Haven, uh, which has been a contracted out project. Uh, the, the highway crew is now working on Oakwood Road, uh, so we're putting in drainage, and um, within uh, two weeks, we'll be reclaiming that road and base paving it. At the same time, then we're going to go up and reclaim Spruce Road and Tips Cove Road. We've got a lot of drainage work to, there, to do there, and we've got to add a little bit of gravel. Uh, so we'll have base paving, hopefully, on Oakwood Road uh, in about two to three weeks. And on, on Spruce and Tips Cove, though, we have a lot of drainage work, and the road is so bad there, we're not going to reclaim it first and then start the drainage. Uh, we probably won't be doing any base paving there until uh, late June, early July. Uh, but um, again, the road is in such bad shape, it'll probably be better once it's reclaimed than it is now. Um, the other work we're doing under the road money, we're doing the bridge um, preventing the maintenance uh, program, and um, that's going to be kicked off pretty soon. Also, with uh, you know developing a um, maintenance program for the bridges. Mass Landing parking lot. If anyone's been by there, you can see we've been uh, ripping that all up, and um, we uh, we're hoping that it was going to get paved today. The uh, paving contractor backed out. They will be here tomorrow. Uh, so we'll have the base pavement in uh, for, for the lower parking lot and the upper parking lot. 
Uh, a lot of the drainage uh, improvements have been already installed. Uh, and then a week from uh, today, we will be doing the porous pavement, which is one section that's going to be where the uh, boat trailer parking is going to be. And then hopefully finishing the rest of the um, overlay. Now, that's dependent on my contractor schedule and weather. So uh, I'm still warning people that probably next week, for most of the week, the, uh, the lot will be closed for parking. We'll be able to allow some boats to get in and out. Uh, but next Wednesday, close to everybody. And then hopefully uh, on Thursday, Friday, we can kind of open it. Uh, and from that point on, we can be just working on the edges. So uh, again, we apologize for the inconvenience, especially the island residents. So we've been trying to accommodate them. But I think everyone's going to be happy when they're done. It's going to be a really, uh, really good project. Um, Contractor's doing very, very good there. And the dockside boat ramp, like I said, that this is the funding part of it. So uh, the design is uh, is getting ready to go out to bid. And um, again, uh, we uh, hope to uh, start that work mid to late October once all the uh, activities are done down dockside and, uh, and we get that boat ramp and uh, all, all fixed up. So I went through it pretty quick, but anyone has any questions on that or any other pro uh, public works projects? Is, is uh, Pete, Pete still here? Are you going to talk about the other project, Pete? Are, you, are there capital projects? Pete, did you want to talk to the non-DPW projects? Pete Chamberlain, finance director again. Um, probably have noticed my new format on the supplemental report. Hopefully it's a little more exciting than it was <laughs> in previous years. Um, the, um, there are, let's see, one, two, four projects that I've listed of interest. The first was the Fossfield Replacement Building, um, which was budgeted at $299,320. Uh, about uh, 9,105.50 uh, expended a day. As, as David said, that's going to get kicked off a little bit later on in the year. Uh, I also put a note in there that was uh, uh, a total of 201,718.50 available for transfer in from the capital reserve fund. So as you'll remember, there was a certain amount of money that we had budgeted for that. So there's a little bit more uh, that will credit this project. The electric meter upgrades has been an ongoing project for several years now, and Barry's uh, uh, done a good job in getting that thing uh, in a wrap-up mode. So really, within a short period of time, the only thing he'll have to he'll have is, uh, is, uh, is to purchase the balance of the meters to close the, and then you'll, uh, you'll get those installed uh, fairly quickly. Is Barndor Island included Little Barndor Island? Excuse me? Is Little Barndor Island included with Barndor Island? I don't. I got, I'm going to have to plead ignorance on that, I, Dave. I, I think they already did the uh, AMR meter installation out on all the islands. Those are already operational. The Sewell Road vo uh, voltage conversion is uh, wrapping up. Uh, the conversion day has been scheduled for, well, actually, it's, it was, yes, uh, was yesterday, as a matter of fact. And there'll be a small amount of work to do on it uh, after that. So there's a balance of 34000 on that particular project. And then there's this year, the last year's, uh, or is it this year's? This year's uh, 390 line survey in engineering. Uh, the uh, bid for the survey portion was awarded to HEB Engineering for a not to exceed of 55000 uh, Survey work has been uh, authorized and uh, purchase orders are pending. Uh, so uh, this report, this particular project is going right along also. So. Any 
any questions for uh, Pete? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving right along. Um, so I wrote this memo about the New Hampshire DOT uh, paving overlay. Uh, they are planning on overlaying um, Route 109 from Pickering Corner, uh, Center Street, out to uh, the Tufton Borough Town Line. Um, part of that, because it's uh, funded by federal money, they're requiring that all the crosswalks be brought up to um, the ADA standards. We have all tip downs at our crosswalks, uh, but they are requiring that we have the uh, visually impaired um, detectors, which are the little bubble domes. And um, I was concerned that those were going to be uh, put in haphazardly and might create more problems. Uh, so we had a meeting, and um, they came down, looked at it, and I wrote this memo um, trying to um, do what I thought was best for the town instead of trying to put something in there that, um, while well meaning, may end up causing a problem, um, I thought it'd be best that we take our time, engineer it properly, go from the front of the buildings out to the curb lines, and, and make sure all the grades are properly, the sidewalks are rebuilt. Um, after I wrote the letter, I had a couple of discussions with an engineering firm to actually to get a number of what that was going to cost, and then I started to realize that um, it's not just the sidewalks. You know, we, we've got to worry about our drainage issues, which are underneath the sidewalks. Uh, we have some water lines that come off the mains that need to be corrected, um, and uh, the project started to grow. And then I had a little deja vu, which was uh, back in 2010, uh, the state was going to do an overlay of Route 28, and they did an overlay. And uh, but the section between Center Street uh, from uh, Pickering Corner out to the falls was in such bad shape. I said, "Wait a second. Why don't we do this properly instead of just doing a quick overlay? Why don't we design it and build it properly?" And the state agreed, and we went to a municipally managed project. Unfortunately, uh, you know, seven years later, we still haven't broken ground. We, we, we have watered the contract, and we are now going forward with it. Um, so after I wrote the letter, now I was thinking, well, wait a second, this is a, a good discussion for the selectmen. We, we have the choice to uh, delay, which would require us to kind of go quickly within two years, appropriate money to engineer and try to resolve those issues with the sidewalks. But then it could grow into a bigger project, which then could delay even more. Um, and I'm wondering what, whether or not we might want to say, Let's take the overlay, and the overlay basically will improve the driving surface for a few years. This is the, the uh, DOT strategy, not rebuilding the roads, they just overlay every seven years, and it's a three-quarter inch shim. And while it won't look great, it'll help the driving surface, and then it will still go ahead and do the crosswalks, and they'll best fit them best they can. Um, knowing that really what needs to be done is a total rebuild, and we, we have been, um, I think, in a few years ago, 2014, I had proposed to start the engineering for all of South and North Main Street, but because we had so many projects ongoing and we hadn't completed the big Center Street project, I think we pushed it off a little. But a, a project of this scope really is, and it's really important for our future because uh, the, it probably would be a second to Center Street, will be, a, a, again, very important. It'll, it'll uh, dictate what the town will look like for the next 100 years. And um, while I think I can get a lot done, I, I realize my plate is full as we are now because, like I said, the Center Street project is going to go for a year and a half. The RAB project is ongoing. Uh, and then numerous other ones we had just discussed. Uh, so if we were to go with my recommendation, it probably something else would get pushed off to try to jam it in. So at this point now, I think I am um, kind of retracting my recommendation as in delaying. And, and thinking that maybe we ought to have this discussion here and, and possibly maybe we should take it, get the overlay now, continue in working and, and put the plans going forward. But it's, it'll take seven to 10 years uh, to get all the planning done to do it properly. So I'm kind of um, here now to discuss with the board, see what you think. I'm always good for a conversation. <clears throat> um, I agree with you. When I saw this recommendation, I started to think about what it was going to entail for us to get this project done. And it seemed to me even two years from now, it would be a rush. And I thought about the, when we had designed something for Dockside and we brought the public in, they didn't like it. We had to go back. And it, you really would need to do that first. I thought about what we had done at the railroad station and how we had gotten the uh, electric lines and put the older, nicer looking um, lights there and that we really need to take a long look at how we want our main street to look. And 
whatever, that it's all going to be on our dime. And I think it's important that we take the time and we design it properly and the public has a, has a lot of input on how it looks. So I would like to go with take the overlay and spend the time designing it right and getting that water line done and all the other things that we've done when we've done a major road upgrade. I agree. Yeah, I also agree with that too, Dave. And I've got a question for you. We do take their overlay. They're going to go basically 24 feet wide, right? The two 12-foot lanes. 26 feet, yeah. 26, okay. And we, we plan on leaving the, the strips between that and the, and the curbing alone for right now. Yeah, I think we have to because of the complications. In some of the areas, our curbs have dropped down, and our curb reveal is down to two or three inches. Right. If we put another overlay, then cars aren't, they're going to be driving up on the sidewalks. So that becomes a dangerous situation. So I would, uh, I would say we probably don't want to do that this year. We, we would go ahead and, and just overlay. And knowing that, we're going to follow up with a bigger project. And maybe this will help us move it faster. But. So they're willing to, are they willing to grind that whole edge up through there to, to blend the pavement in and stuff? They will drive a strip that they will tie into. Yep. yep. Okay. That's part of the contract. Uh, doing that, will we still, at that point, have to address all our downs and the ADA stuff even though they're not going all the way to the curb line? They, that's correct. They will have to address, they will have to, um, the contractor had bid the number, they will have to uh, make a best fit, as I said, the, uh, the engineer from uh, uh, Conca said 25% can meet the standards, the other 75% they'll have to do a best fit, but they will have to break up the tip downs and uh, they'll do them in concrete, so the, uh, there'll be the steel ones that'll be embedded in concrete and they'll, uh, they'll do their best to make them, to make them work. And they're not going to put the domes in, right? Are they going to put those uh, pad domes in? Yes. And we don't have any say on whether they go in or not, and whether they go in on every one of our crosswalks. Correct. I mean, that's a lot of lighting for this community. No, no, no. Not, uh, I miss, um, when I'm saying the domes, the little bubble domes yeah. on, the, on the plates, not, not above. Not that big. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm seeing all these big, huge things going in there. No, no, no. That's, that's no, no, no lighting okay. requirement. Okay. Thank you. Dave? As part of this, there was, was quite a lot of discussion about North Main Street going up the hill with the drainage and the, and the um, catch basins and all that. That's all going to be done as part of this still? The, the catch basins, they're saying, are our responsibility because they're outside the white lines. So we are going to rebuild uh, the basins, uh, the ones that are, are deteriorated. And we'll, we already did one. We have another three or four that are going to get done. Um, as you go north from uh, Sewell Road, um, the breakdown is the contract. He told me that they agree we need to do that. So they're going to find additional funds. And that will be hand work. That will be a separate contract to try to pave from Sewell Road right. up, uh, that's kind of so broken. That'll, that'll be done as part of this overlay? It's a separate contract, okay. but DOT told me they would find the funds to get that done. So th this paving contract is continental. They just want to lay three quarter inch and just go, go, go. They're going to start uh, at nighttime after six o'clock, and then the next day, it'll be all the way out to Tuftenburg and all the way back. That's their plan to get it all banged out pretty fast. So we're all set there. Yep. Uh, I think the only thing we will have to do is we will have to sign the maintenance agreement on the sidewalks, uh, on, the, on the crosswalks. Um, and the one thing that they did also recommend is that we, we take out parking spaces within 20 feet and put the appropriate lighting in, which would be the, very, the bright lighting on the approach sides. Uh, but they, the engineer from Concord told me why those are strong recommendations and that they will not um, force us to do that. Um, at some point, we will have to look at again if we do bump outs, which is what the mm -hmm. some of the stuff we had talked about in the future, uh, that would then make it safer because the pedestrian. I mean, they could see the pedestrians, mm -hmm. and we still could save some of the parking. So that's the type of study I think you were talking yep. about that yep. uh, our crosswalks where we could do a better job uh, in working together. So that's something we'll have to sign off on. And again, that project is not scheduled until after Labor Day uh, with DOT. So that's what we'll tell them that we'll go ahead and, and take everything they have right now and, and make it work, and then. Um, we will continue working on the uh, Main Street project as we go forward. Very good. The, um, the next item was the um, scenic and gravel roads uh, public forum. On April 6th, we had a, um, a really, I think, a positive meeting. We had a lot of uh, interested citizens and stakeholders uh, came to our meeting in which we 
um, had a presentation of how we maintain roads, and um, we had a lot of, um, I think, uh, good input from uh, our stakeholders. Um, we had a, uh, we wrote down all the comments, and um, we took notes in the meeting. So, and attached to my memo, uh, there's all the detailed comments that went on. And what I tried to do in my memo was to uh, summarize what I thought were the most pertinent ones and ones we were acting on. So um, what I'd like to do is kind of go through those issues one at a time. We can discuss them. And if anyone has any questions or comments, be more than happy to, uh, to answer them. <clears throat> one of the ones that the people might have been surprised at is that we don't have a detailed uh, road standards or maintenance procedures. Um, it's it's um, how we do business. Uh, uh, we uh, kind of um, we go. Um, we have practices. We they're pretty much an outline, and that's what we presented in the in the presentation. And they're also attached here. What our spring, summer, fall maintenance are, and then how we how we plow the roads. We do have a winter uh, snow removal policy, which is pretty specific about how we treat the roads. Um, and I think um, what we're pro uh, proposing to do here now, because we've had some turnover, which led to some of our problems last year, um, a better um, detail of how we maintain not only our gravel roads, but um, all our roads. And I think uh, we're proposing to um, work on that over the summer and the fall and uh, present something to the selectmen in the first quarter in the public and then uh, implement them uh, for next season. Uh, the reason um, I want to take some time with this is because we have our plates full right now. I've got uh, a lot of projects that are, are going on right now. I have four construction projects out in the field that are occurring right now. Uh, we have the biggest ones going to start Center Street this summer. And um, it just there's a lot going on. And, and I, I'd rather take my time and do this properly uh, and get the good reference material uh, from uh, the, the uh, New Hampshire T-Squared Center uh, and in different uh, uh, areas where we can get the technical information, pull it together in a nice manual. And, uh, and we would move forward uh, with that. And on that, are you going to do some training with your staff? Yeah, that was another issue we had with regards to training. Uh, issue number I was, five. I meant on number one, on the when you do these standards and stuff, are you going to do in-house training with them? Not what you said down well, below. We, we're ongoing right now, so our training has been uh, uh, stepped up this year. So we're already working with the uh, uh, greater operators and equipment operators in terms of uh, uh, doing a much better job in, in terms of the grading of the road and the drainage. Uh, Scott Pike is going to take the lead on this, and he's going to um, be out there with the crews, uh, working with them. Um, unfortunately, this year we were start. Uh, this was going to be the week we we're going to start hitting the gravel roads, uh, but our grader broke down. We had a major um, engine problem, so that's in pieces now. We're going to be about a week, a week and a half behind schedule. Uh, but this is the time where we would uh, grade the roads and then um, put the magnesium chloride to it and roll them to get the good surface for the summer and get them all bound up for, for dust control. Uh, so that's going to be a little little delayed, but um, we will uh, continue to uh, train in-house as well as train with the T-Square Swinter at UNH with some of the, uh, the newer guys who haven't been to the training. And then when the, uh, uh, the procedure manual comes out, we'll reinforce that and we'll have what we'll also call the best management practices. So when someone goes out, if they have any questions, there'll be a manual. And again, they will be trained on that. And each year we'll have refresher courses so that they uh, we can hope we can get more consistency with our uh, maintenance. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll make one comment. I live on a gravel road, and one of the things that happened this year is the the roads were not at least bracket road was not crowned properly, and that has caused us big potholes and puddling. And so, and I know we had a new grader operator, and so that's why I was asking on about what kind of training. You know, if, if it's if some of this is done correctly, and so that's why my question was there to you. Well, the, uh, we had a change of operators too uh, there. The, we had thrown someone in the truck who was new. Someone had left till the end of the year, and a guy came in. He didn't work out. He's not with us any longer, but uh, he might have been plowing a little heavy. He knocked down a lot of this. He did a lot of the damage out there, which hadn't been done in years um, when the other operator was there. So that, again, was a lack of training for that, uh, that operator, but we'll make sure they do a better job. Uh, in the summer in terms of the crown. But just so you're aware, we, we do crown the roads uh, in the summertime, but in the wintertime, when plowing season comes out, we do knock that crown down. You don't want to have a big crown 
and it, but it was it was probably plowed it, off. It was never crammed. I yep, mean, you yep. can see it, it, we have more of this okay. kind of yep. the situation going on, and I've lived on that road for almost 40 years, and it has always been crowned better than yep. it was this year. Yep. So that's what I'm asking about the training of who's going to run that equipment and whether we've got somebody. And what I hear you saying to me is Scott Pike will go out and check what those guys are doing and that they're doing it right. Absolutely. And, and those procedures will be documented in the manual and then we'll follow up. But uh, just because I won't have everything in the manual this year doesn't mean we're not going to go, we're, gonna, we're implementing the training right now, you know, and it's ongoing all the time. Uh, another thing was a follow up with individual stakeholders to review specific concerns. Uh, we have done that already. We'll continue to do that. Um, we've, um, again, trying to correct problems that have developed over, over years of, uh, and um, our, our commitment is to uh, try to do uh, uh, best we can and uh, to meet with individuals uh, and try to resolve those issues uh, as long as they don't cost-wise or time-wise don't get crazy. If there becomes a project where we can't reach agreement uh, that the cost would be too much or the effort would be too much, we might have to come back to the board and see whether or not uh, this is a special project we're going to want to take on. Um, as I stated um, the, um, somewhere else here, Many of our roads um, were never designed. They, 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 they came out of, mm -hmm. it was a you know, path to go from one person's house to another house, and then the roads developed. And um, since I've been here, we've never really, uh, really rebuilt. The only road we've really rebuilt was um, uh, Trash Mountain Road. And we had a grant, and that was to put some drainage in. That was a road that uh, had chronically would, would have, uh, uh, every spring it would flood out, and the road would wash out. Uh, we got a, a grant mitigation program for that, and that was the one we kind of we had some plans and developed it. And, and, but most of the roads, uh, they just have evolved. And, and um, we talk about road standards, and it's not like we ever designed this. You know, the the, the hills, the, the the trees, the rocks, it's what we inherited, and we're trying to make the best do. Um, but I, I think the um, and, and what happens is we the drainage is one of the most important things. Uh, and I, I think we need to do a better job working with the property owners in those areas where we have drainage problems. And, uh, and again, the water does flow downhill, so we have these prescriptive rights where the water has always gone. We kind of continue using those turnouts, uh, but we have to do a better job of erosion control. And that's something that, uh, again, I mentioned on uh, issue four. But um, so this is going to be ongoing, and we'll continue working with the uh, with property owners on that. Um, Maintenance on scenic roads, this was obviously one of the, the biggest issues in, in, the, in the idea. And, and my first comment was, I, I realized it was, uh, I think um, Susan Ryan's brought to my attention, that the, uh, the scenic road, it's, it's, it's a matter of formality. Each year we should look at it and say, okay, this is what it is, and just re reissue it. So when I, uh, when I say here that we'll update the list, because the list I had might have had one road off, or our sections of the road weren't clear. So we want to make sure the, the road is uh, clear, uh, the scenic road list is clear. And each day we look at it and make sure people understand because we have not taken as a priority. I would, if, if we went and asked all my equipment operators which, which ones are our scenic roads, they may not know because we hadn't made it a priority. I think we were not as sensitive as, as we should have been. Uh, the community has taken uh, upon itself to designate these roads that way. And um, I think we need to respect that a little more. So I think that was one of the things we heard from the stakeholders. And we, we are going to now, again, with training and also make it a priority that uh, we're much more sensitive when we're on these roads and, and try to, um, to protect the scenic uh, beauty and the, and the rural character of those neighborhoods. Uh, second, um, when we're doing work on these roads, um, if, we, uh, if we have to do any, any significant construction, that uh, we would make sure we go through appropriate protocols, which is if we have to cut a tree down that's above 15 inches in circumference at, uh, at your chest height, that we hold a public hearing and, and we look at uh, those trees. Um, and if we have um, to do any work where we have a difficult situation and it may require widening or uh, altering uh, terrain that hadn't been changed in here, then I think that's also an area where we want to be talking to the uh, property owner so there's no surprises and that uh, if it um, requires it, we'll have a public hearing going forward. Um, one issue that I think we, I did want to discuss, and, and whether it's, uh, I didn't have to make a decision tonight, but maybe it's uh, for a different forum or maybe it's in the uh, master planning on the different structure, but the issue of the width of the roads and the tree canopy within the roads. Um, any road person, uh, a highway person, um, we'd like to see the right-of-way clear uh, for many reasons. Uh, basically so that you have a good travel way and, and you have nice uh, four slopes and back slopes and, and you try to open that up. Uh, any tree within the right-of-way 
uh, can become a hazard for a driver if they go off the road, but trees in our uh, weather up here with ice and snow uh, can become hazards. And um, long term, uh, if we continue to um, uh, just look at the beauty in the summertime with these pretty trees, if you don't cut those trees back, the, the, it right away it starts closing in on you, and it does create a concern. So it's always been myself and Scott Pike, and our, our opinion is that the need is to keep the right of way clear. And, and I, again, I felt that uh, there was many people uh, at the stakeholder meeting and um, who expressed concern about trying to maintain that rural beauty. And I would say that if you see certain roads that the, all the trees are cut from the road to the stone walls and you expose the stone walls and the stone wall is taken care of, that's beautiful. And behind the stone wall, we have beautiful tree stands. So the fact that we still can have a beautiful scenic road, even if you take the trees out. And I, and I think it's something that uh, um, where we don't have a solid policy on this, I think it's, it's something that, you know, again, it shouldn't be day four that dictates that. That's my opinion. It's, it's most road people would, would agree that you should have your right-of-way clear of trees. It, again, lets the sun in to dry the roads up. It, uh, it stops the snow from falling off the trees after you've plowed it. Um, it also, in our situation, because we own the electric lines, it also, uh, you know, helps the, uh, the, you know, the power lines. And um, it's something that I think we need to discuss. So at this point, I don't know what the selectman's opinion on of, of this is or, or how we, we want to go about that. But uh, one of the things we had brought up was plows that had hit the trees. And I'll, I'll defend my guys because sometimes if you're out 24 hours straight and you're in the middle of a blizzard and you're going down the road and, and you're hard to see things, it's you know, they make mistakes and they hit the trees, but, you know, 99% of the times they're not hitting trees, so it's not really being careless. It's just sometimes if you've been in that truck for 24 hours, uh, things can happen. But then it brings back the point, if the tree is close enough to the wing, it probably should be removed. Now, that would be my opinion. And one of the things I, I'm going to do is look at these trees on, on a road-by-road -road basis, and, 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 and but also with input from yourself and the public, whether or not we would consider removing these trees because they are too close and they, uh, they do present... Uh, uh, there's a, you know, a, a, a situation where the pros and cons, where the pros of the tree is, okay, it's nice, it's beautiful, it provides a canopy, but there's another tree that's five feet away or 10 feet away that's doing the same thing. And by taking this tree down, you eliminate some of the negatives that tree presents, which is the hazard for drivers, uh, the potential for the ice and snow, and, um, and the, uh, allowing the roads to dry up better. So um, it's something that I don't know if the board has any feeling on it or whether or not we want to uh, you know, let the, you know, be discussed in the master planning, or whether or not we should have follow-up uh, public forums specifically about the tree canopy and, and the road width. I, I have a comment. Um, I <clears throat> have sent an email to Dave Owen with a lot of my concerns, um, and one of my biggest concern is the way we're plowing on our smaller roads and our scenic roads. We've gotten larger trucks. The trucks are coming down with their plow and wing down and they just come, and what we used to do is come in in a speed with our plow on and come back and wing. And we didn't do anywhere near as much damage by doing it in that manner, and I think on those scenic and those smaller dirt roads, we should go back to that policy. If I wanted to have a clear runway, I'd live in suburbia, where you don't have trees by the road and you have all this other stuff. I think. People make choices on where they live. And when you live on a dirt road, you, t you have to realize that you are going to have a narrow road. You are going to have potholes. You are going to have puddles. Emergency equipment is never going to come to you at the same speed um, that they can on other roads because they just can't go that fast on a dirt road. You're going to have dust. And that's some of the risks that you take as you you live in those areas because you're looking for a certain look. Um, I'd bef way prefer to have a smaller right of way coming in. Um, we just purchased a whole lot of new equipment for our fire and rescue in order to come in on some of those roads. So personally, I want that rural character. I want that rural look. I, want, I would like to see us not riding the roads. Bracket Road keeps on getting wider and wider every year. There's no need to do that, and I think in the process, when the wing and the plow went down this year, the amount of silt and sand that got thrown into the woods, the grass still hasn't come up over that thickness. And so I think we could be a little bit more careful and look at what fits a small scenic road with maybe a tree uh, closer to the road that we 
purchase a smaller truck, put a smaller plow on it, go down with the plow, and then come back with the wing. Other roads, you could just go down as you've been doing it, but I think some of those scenic and gravel roads, that is the approach I would like to see. I, I think there are some definite regulations on scenic roads, or roads that are supposedly scenic roads. Is, uh, is my understanding, it's designated. The only really uh, specific rule is that you can't cut trees or you can't damage stone wall without having a public hearing with the planning board. I re that's what I'm saying. Yep. And I think we Has need to fo reformalize or find out what those roads are again. Yep. Yeah, we have the list. I mean, we know what they are. They're, they're I know where quite a few of them are, too, but I mean, I think that we need to know and the crews need to know which roads are designated scenic roads. Yep. And I don't disagree that yeah, trees are going to get scraped, foam poles get hit, too. They get broken off by wings. So, yep. I mean, it isn't just the trees. Yep. It's foam poles and everything else. But, yeah, I, I think that we need to make that list readily available to all the all the guys on the highway crews. Right, but I, that's, that's it's, and we've already committed to doing that, so I think we, we, we're in agreement there. But the, the idea that we're not going to use a wing or we're not going to plow the travel way and, and knock off the shoulder, uh, again, uh, with the point that we had a bad year on Bracket Road last year, uh, and that was more due to driver error, um, I think in Bracken Road is different because that's a dead end road with only a half a dozen residences. That's not the same as a started road where you have it through traffic going through, or, or um, you know Haynes Hill Road. Um, so I, I, I would disagree with you, Linda, and I would like to hear from some of the other board members what you think about the, the width of the road and, and whether or not we should not plow roads properly because they're scenic. I think. Um you know, every road is, is, is different, has its own character and its own own issues and things like that. Uh, you know, whether it be trees, telephone poles, as Dave said, you know, even rocks, boulders on the side there. So, um, you know, that being said, I think, you know, you touched on a little bit earlier, having your crew aware of which roads are the scenic ones would be important and stuff, but, you know, which you've addressed there. Um, and also to keep in mind too, this year, as you well know, that April storm we had we got quite a thaw just before it. So most of that damage that happened to these dirt roads was in that storm because a lot of that top two or three inches of gravel along with the winter sand that was on it had thawed out. Um, plows picked a lot of that up and that's what's in the ditches and on the slopes right now. Um, you know, I'm dealing with that all over the place in, in Ossipi too. So um, that's just one of those strange Storms that we, you know, public works guys hate to see. So, um, you know, so, anyway, that being said, I think you know, one way you could do it would be, you know, on these narrow roads like down on Bracket Road, possibly, you know, during the storm, you know, keep it opened up. Then at the end of the storm, when it's clear out, everybody can see good, then, you know, push them back at that time and stuff. Uh, you know, we've done that on a couple of roads. Uh, you know, as you know, every road is a little different, and each of the drivers and their routes, you know, have to adapt to their obstacles that are that are in the way. Because that's that's pretty much what it is. It's you know, sometimes those trees, the telephone poles, are our wake up too for after 20 hours out in the truck. It kind of well, okay, yeah, that's where I am now. So, you know, and it happens. I mean, oh, yeah. it's uh, no Tough doubt time. it happened. You know, I was plowing 109A for the state and stuff. You you know, after 20 or 30 hours, you do you. And lose track of you know things there, so it, it's 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 uh, kind of a normal thing, I'd say. I agree. I mean, I, I think that you know what I see is that it was an unusual year with the, with the thaw. I mean, I plow a lot, and it's the roads were were tough, you know. But you know, along with the training that's going to go on in the grading and all that stuff, you know, it, I, I think just. What Linda's saying is more attention to detail be paid, or at least an attempt attention to detail. And we all know the guys do a great job plowing. There's, there's no doubt. We had a great, we had a crazy winter this year. Town roads were maintained excellent uh, every snowstorm, and that's that's a credit to to you and to the department as a whole. Uh, so, but I think more detail to those those scenic roads. And more details that the drivers who plow those just just know that 
you know, the, the residents want care to be taken when they're being plowed. All right. I'll definitely agree with that too. That you know, I think the roads in Wolf Borough have been taken care of very, very well. It's one of the one of the top towns around and stuff as far as maintenance and uh, you know the winter plowing and and uh, you know you know those guys should be proud of, of what they do out there. So. And I don't disagree with that. I'm talking about, and I thought we were going to talk about from that meeting was the width of the roads that are going to be plowed and how much needs to be plowed and. My, my feeling is, and if you're agreeing, I can't quite tell, different roads need to, may be plowed to different widths. And I think that that's what I'm trying to get here, that a, a dirt road, um, not highly traveled, can be plowed at a, at a different, with different standards than we do um, down the other end of Pleasant Valley Road, where there's more space. And that's what I, the point I'm trying to get at. I do, I support, I did not make the comments at the scenic road, I support our staff. I thank them for what they do. This is m what I see. I'm trying to give you what I see and what I've experienced. Right. And in no way am I trying to get it, say that the staff doesn't uh, do a good job. But I think there are some changes that we can make. And, and one of them is that question, does every road have to be the same width? And bracket road just keeps on getting bigger and wider. And, and so I think that's a legitimate question that you asked the board. and. I would like to have varying widths, and on the smaller uh, rural roads that we don't make them as wide. Okay, um, I'll move on to issue four, which is we kind of talked a little bit about the drainage ditches, outlets, grading, and erosion control. Uh, we had a lot of constructive criticisms with regards to that, and I have to agree, we have uh, um, some embarrassments uh, in terms of how we take care of uh, water once it starts running down the road. And you, um, again, we have some unique uh, topography and, and uh, geology and, and trees and rocks, and things were allowed to uh, just happen. Um, we don't, again, I've never, again, except for that um, Trash Mountain Road, we never really designed a system. We kind of work it with the guys in the field. I think what we want to do is to, um, to revisit that. And, and uh, this year, we want to focus on a few of the roads. We are. Um, and, uh, and try to uh, implement the BMPs, which you talked about, getting them uh, trained properly. So we're, Scott's going to work with the crew on showing them what it looks like, and, and, and hopefully we'll get agreement once those are done. Everyone agrees that's what, what we want it to look like, and take pictures and say, this is how you get there, and then work towards that uh, eventually to cover all uh, you know, 14 miles of gravel road. It's not going to happen in one season. Uh, again, our, our focus this year is on uh, you know, our started uh, uh, Stoneham, Started Road, um, Bickford Road, and Chick Road. It's kind of a loop there. We have some issues, and uh, we'd like to get the guys trained and do this properly. The rest of the roads will all be graveled and will be maintained, but we're going to focus on some of the really bad areas we have there. Uh, that being said, um, we have some significant grade issues where we have, you know, a stone wall here and then one foot out. The road is down three, four feet deeper. Uh, so those are going to be tricky. And uh, again, I don't. Uh, hope people understand. I'm not a magician. Uh, we can't just wave a magic wand. We're going to do our best we can within the, the budgets and the manpower we have to uh, correct these, and I think we can do a great deal better. So that's our commitment to do that. And um, again, we will then also um, memorialize those in the procedures when we get that done in this year. Uh, in addition, uh, again, some of the, the comments about experience and the um, uneven maintenance. Um, I, um, the one comment there is I agree we could do additional training. We have had a lot of turnover. Some of the guys have moved on to other jobs, and we had brought some younger people in uh, last year, losing Scott Pike, and then, uh, and then having um, other people go out on leave. We were short, and uh, we, I think we, we felt some pain there. Uh, so this year we are going to, uh, again, do a better job with the training, and we will uh, commit to that. Um, with regards to some of the, um, again, while I, I agree that we can do better, I still think our crew, like you've said tonight, is, uh, is better than most. I think we do a pretty good job, all hard work and dedicated uh, workers, and uh, I feel our town is, uh, should be proud of our roads, and I'm proud of them. Uh, however, if the, the board feels it was necessary, uh, we could always do a peer review. We could bring in a consultant from the outside uh, to look at our, our, our work, our, our roads, uh, how we do our work, how we maintain our equipment, and how we spend our money. And then to, uh, if, if there was a, enough of a, a concern from the public or the selectmen, um, the only way to do a fair, objective review is to have an independent third party 
uh, do a, a, a baseline study or a peer review. Uh, that can cost lots of money, and, and I'm not recommending it, but I'm, I'm, I'm offering it there because, I, again, I think we would stand up very well uh, to any, any community uh, our size or that, that has a complexity. Even though we're a small town, we're like a city because we have a complete you know, public works and, and water sewer department. And uh, again, I, I don't, uh, uh, don't think we have to be too defensive because I'm agreeing we can do better and we want to move forward with a lot of the recommendations that were brought up at the, at the forum. And again, this is a, a choice for the selectmen whether or not you think it's necessary or not. I don't know if, uh, again, it would take some time and some money if, if, anyone, if you wanted that. No comments on that one? I don't, I don't feel a need. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we need to go that direction, personally. Okay, yeah. good. That's just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I got one question. Is, is On this whole subject, on all, is this something that, you know, that we could uh, have Scott Pike, you know, kind of take the, the lead on this, like on this, this particular, like looking after the different recommendations that we're going to make in the, in the end? Is that something that he could tackle? He's been around, he knows these roads, yep. he knows them really well. I mean, and it'd be nice to have someone of that, of that caliber, of that, with that background, to be able to do the peer review, teach these guys how to do proper grading and all that stuff and the plowing of the roads. Is that something that? He, he is right now. In fact, I've designated him that when he came back as assistant director. Uh, we put him back in in charge of that, so he is responsible for training all the young guys now, and he will be uh, working with Adam Tasker in developing the procedures manual that we talked about. And um, I am um, more and more focused on the capital projects and the bigger things, and then he would be more fo focused on the operations and the maintenance, and specifically uh, gravel road maintenance. That being said, we have maintenance of a lot of other things besides gravel roads, water systems, sewer systems, mm -hmm. uh, and even now at the downtown. There's a lot going on, but he will be the main point and going forward. Yep, that's okay. that's the plan. Uh, issue six, which is kind of a uh, kind of came out because it is an embarrassment. Um, we, um, if you had an opportunity or, or the unfortunate opportunity to have to drive that road in March, uh, or if, uh, it was. Um, this is probably the worst it's ever been, uh, and it was. Uh, in 2010, when we had our RSMS, it was rated the worst road in, in 2010. At that point, um, the, we had to do something, and we did a, a shim overlay. Uh, two years later, we followed up with a chip seal to help kind of stop the cracks. And it, and, it, and it gave us a decent driving service for about you know four years. Uh, in 2015, it started to, to uh, deteriorate. And last year, it, it just uh, it fell apart. Uh, the, when the cracks opened up, I, uh, you know, the uh, it just seemed to uh, get worse, and, and there's some areas where the differential um, settling was, uh, was really bad, so that if you tried to, to drive the speed limit at 30 miles an hour, you'd be, uh, you'd be really in, in danger. Um, it's a difficult road. It's, it's something that has not been rebuilt. It's, it's uh, you know, one of probably our oldest roads, but uh, it has, uh, again, the, the geology underneath it that's frost susceptible. The rocks, you can see them, are keep heaving up. Uh, we don't have a drainage system on either side of the road. Um, we have a couple of cross culverts. So what really needs to be done is, if you remember Middleton Road, it was similar to how bad Middleton Road was done before we had it engineered and, and bid out and, and properly constructed, which requires us to box out some of the bad material, uh, put in under drains where the water is trapped in there, and to, uh, and to give it a good base coat and, and a top coat. Uh, that could be very expensive, and it would be um, difficult to uh, you know, fit it in right now as we've been struggling to get to other roads that haven't been touched. And this road has had two projects in the last uh, seven years. Um, so that's one option. The other option, uh, of, uh, which was brought up because uh, it was so bad, whether or not we could rec reclaim it and return it back to a gravel road until we can properly fund it and, and you know, engineer it and, and rebuild it. Um, that's drastic, and that's not something I'm recommending, but it's, it's just, uh, it's out there that, uh, actually, Scott Pike says, which David, so bad, what, what if we did that if we can't afford to build it properly? And then we could go at it in sections uh, in terms of trying to uh, remove some of the rocks that are coming up and maybe start installing drainage and kind of do a phased approach uh, with, with work there. Uh, but I am at a loss at, uh, at how to proceed with that, and I want to put that in the, uh, for discussion with the board. Just say, Dave, I wouldn't uh, necessarily rule out that idea of, of uh, turning it back to a gravel road for the time being. Um, you are able to do that when you're able to keep it smoothed up and stuff in the, you know, during the summertime, the spring and stuff. Um, you know, it, it's, I don't think that's, uh, you know, 
that bad of an idea or should be, you know, maybe brought up, you know, thought of a little bit more anyway and stuff like that. Um, just because it's, if we don't do anything to it, it's going to get worse each year too. Um, the, yeah, the, yeah, the frost teams will, once the cracks start open and the way it's failed, it's, it's, um, it's really a, a tough shape. So, um, and, it, and it's something that's going to have an impact on, on the property owners. You know, maybe we should have a, a public meeting and, and with that discussion, that sole purpose, would that be overkill? But you think that might, might be important if we're going to do such a drastic change? I'd want to make sure everyone had a say in it. That'd be very appropriate myself. I think that'd be great. I think that's right on. And I'd like to, I would like to know the, if you did it in the in a phase process, how would you see that going? You would go, you know, what kind of sections and, and stuff like that. And uh, so we have an idea right. what you're thinking of. Well, one of the things I think that uh, also is the, um, we had talked about the road service management system in which in 2010 we had it done in 2013. It was supposed to be done last year, but because, again, we had a rough year, it didn't get done. Um, I believe that should be done, and as we had a, 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 um, a resident in a few weeks ago talking about a long-term plan, and I still think I'd like to be able to get that long-term plan done. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to contract that out, so that was one of the things in terms of using uh, one of our consultants, probably Underwood Engineers, I've, I've asked them for a proposal uh, to not only do the uh, assessment of the uh, 66 miles of road this year, but also develop a long-term plan, kind of like we want to talk about next on the asset management on the water system, look at all the roads, look at a long year, 10 year plan, and then see where those, the real bad roads that have to get done sooner than later, and, and then uh, see where this one would fall in, and whether or not, uh, like say, if we, if we put it back to a gravel state, how long would it take before we'd have the funding to go ahead and, and, and bring mm -hmm. it back to a, a paved uh, road? Um, so why don't I work on that, and then come back to the board at some point, maybe uh, in the summer, later the summer, that we can then uh, have a discussion about both the uh, overall um, roads uh, as an asset management plan and specifically about North Wolfboro, uh, what do we do with that this year? Because that, that is kind of an emergency and I think it does, and it's a very heavily traveled road uh, because it does become, again, a cut through when people are uh, heading that way. So I will, um, I'll put that on, uh, on my to-do list and uh, we will then, uh, and also um, for people out there, if anyone who lives on the road, if they have an opinion, if they want to email me or give me a call or just stop me, I'll be more happy to bring that up. But I think uh, we won't do anything unless we have that public meeting and have their input. We all agree on that. Yep. Well, very good. Anything else does anyone want to say or comment on with regards to the, uh, the forum or my follow-up? I just, I wanted to say that uh, I have received, you know, a lot of communication from members of the public. So, you know, at a subsequent meeting, I'd like to, I'm gonna have, allow members to speak on this issue that have, now that we have your recommendations you've come back with, we're gonna take some time and think about, you know, how, to, how we wanna handle things. But in the next meeting, we're gonna allow members of the public to voice their opinion on, you know, how they feel the roads, what should be done with the roads going forward. And I think that's going to be good. Uh, there'll obviously be some public input tonight at, at the, you know, at the, uh, at public input time. But, uh, you know, for the next meeting, I'd like to have it so that members of the public could speak on this issue for a more lengthy amount of time. And if you could be here so we can have some dialogue back and forth, that'd be great. Great. Um, <clears> the <throat> one thing, too, I, I did put this in the package, which was kind of the, Mm -hmm. the, the meets of the RSMS, and it's a little confusing, and that's one of the things I'd like to do when we do the, the, the study this year is pull it together, because what I was trying to show is that in 2010, if you look at that list, we took most of the worst roads were addressed since then, and then in, in 2013, it continues, but it, I never had a chance, because there were some mistakes here, and I was supposed to go back and correct the mistakes, uh, and I never did get back to it, and then before you know, it's three years later. Uh, so uh, I think this gets back to the problem that I'm a bottleneck and I'm trying to, you know, maybe do too much. So uh, this is a project where I think I can have a consultant help me get that wrapped up so we can come back to you and, and have some good dialogue, not only about um, where they are right now, but again, over the 10-year period and a discussion of whether or not we're funding it adequately and, and uh, what other options we might have, uh, whether or not we do a bond to try to t get us out of the hole. I think that's good, and that would also help us when the CIP and we as a board look at how much really does need to go um, to roads. That will give us some of that background information that we really need. Very good. All right. I've got to um, get the PowerPoint set up for the next one for the water inches. Just give me a second. Mr. Chairman, um, could we also uh, just 
jump back. Well, we kind of skipped over a, uh, a motion for Dave on the downtown Main Street overlay. We kind of gave yeah. him a consensus Absolutely. board, but we didn't really ask for a motion and a vote on that. Like I said, I'll make a motion to approve requesting NH. Uh, actually, no, we decided to change that, didn't we, Dave? Yep. Yeah. We're going to request that they uh, go ahead with yeah. make a motion that they go ahead with their overlay overlay project uh, through the downtown area. I'll second that. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Chairman? Yes. Seeing there's an interregnum here, uh, I have been spending a lot of time trying to go over every road in Wolfboro, uh, including up in the hill, uh, dirt roads, uh, whatever. I went down the Key Waden Road and uh, went uh, top to bottom after that was brought up. And uh, as I was mentioning to the Rothkers back here, or to uh, at least to Peter, uh, that the roads, uh, in brief, I think the roads in the town tend to be a couple of things. Well-made, well-constructed roads like Forest Road rebuild, Middleton Road, they're excellent. Uh, roads that started out never were made as roads that are skimmed over like Spruce Road, uh, uh, Port um, Key Waden and so forth, and then dirt roads. I live on a dirt road, and I think generally the dirt roads in the town, I'm just doing this because there's nothing else, no one else is speaking. Dirt roads in the town uh, are nicer condition, That's, not speaking during flooding conditions, but just driving on them now, they're uh, much more pleasant to drive on than our roads that were never made as roads and were skimmed over. Uh, one other thing is that uh, these roads keep changing names. Fullerton Way has changed its name three times in the past, uh, so, uh, past since I've been here. So it's sort of hard to keep track of them when I read in the real report in the Grand Estate News where something's been sold. At. Where is this street? And I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm going to. Um, Turn this over to uh, Mike Unger, who's a project manager for Underwood Engineers, to kind of go through uh, the asset management uh, project. I'm going to kind of fill in on some of the issues. We're going to do a handout, too. This is something else as part of this. Uh, this project, again, was uh, partially funded by a grant uh, from New Hampshire DES uh, to uh, help us with this water system asset management plan. Again, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and, and uh, have him go through the, the, the presentation. You. All right, thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you to the board. As Dave mentioned, we've been uh, working with the town for several months on this asset management plan. Asset management is a program to help operator owners and operators of systems manage their assets in the most cost-effective way over their life cycle. And it has five key parts, which are listed here the inventory, and then ranking of what are the most important or most critical assets, a levels of service agreement, which is basically saying what the benchmarks are that the town wants to meet as far as how you serve your customers. And then life cycle costing, the total cost, replacement cost of the system over the expected life, and then most importantly, a long-term funding plan, how you're going to to fund that over time. And this is just a, a graphic that demonstrates how those different pieces come together into the asset management program. And then at the bottom, implementation. Uh, so what we've done here is develop some tools that the town will be able to use. And the intent is that these become a living document and uh, be used and uh, maintained going forward. And I'll talk about that some more at the end. The inventory, when you start to look at what it takes to, do, to serve the town with water, obviously your treatment facility, the distribution mains, storage tanks, uh, pressure reducing valves and booster pumps, the meters, the vehicles, and there are other assets here that aren't listed, some of your minor assets, it starts to add up. Uh, this is a map of the entire distribution system and just zooming in on one part so you can get an idea of what we've done here. It's color-coded by the size. We've also inventoried 
the entire system by the year that it was installed, the material, and then any key information that the staff had, service history, uh, breaks, and, and maintenance that might have been done. You can also see that, that the hydrants are shown and they're color coded by the available fire flow. And we created uh, laminated copies that the staff can have in their vehicles. So when they go out, uh, they know where the valves and the hydrants are. In addition to the water mains themselves, we also inventoried the vertical assets, which is everything above the ground. And all this information went into an Excel spreadsheet that's user friendly, easily updated, um, the staff can use and work with. So I'll just run briefly through some of the major assets. Obviously the, the treatment facility uh, treats water from Beach Pond. It's not just the building and treatment facility itself, but there are three buildings there, a storage tank, uh, the, the treatment equipment. And then here a summary of the water mains. And the red circle demonstrates that the most of the work that was done on the system happened in those decades between the 1960s and 2000s. And the expected life of a, a water main varies depending on the material and how it was installed, but it's typically between 100 and 120 years. And so you'll see that the cost to replace those assets is out about 50, starting 50 years from now. This is the South Main Street tank. Again, as a, with its expected life, it should last until about the 2050s. We've also included in our life cycle costing the cost to recoat that tank since that's really a capital project every 25 years. You also have a control building and mixer, the chlorination that goes to treat the water in that tank. Pressure reducing valve drops the pressure as it comes down from the storage, uh, from the treatment plant into town to maintain a safe level. And there are a couple valves, the facility itself. And then the Middleton Road booster station raises the pressure for the, the very far end of Middleton Road that's at the higher elevation. Uh, right now it just has two jockey pumps to meet the demands of the users and there have been some discussions and. We did a study to look at what it would take to provide fire protection to, the, to that service zone, and uh, so that may be a project down the road. Once the inventory is developed, then we go through and develop, determine what the risk or criticality of each of those assets is based on the probability or likelihood that it will, it will fail, and that's usually based on the age primarily, and also the material, the type of construction, and then input from the staff. They might know of particular problems of a certain asset that the literature wouldn't suggest. And then the consequence of failure, if you were to lose that asset, what would the impacts be um, as far as service, damage to property, public health, um, and and others. We have a grading matrix that was used to score those. And then when you multiply the two together, you get a risk score that lands you somewhere in that quadrant. So the upper right is the worst scores, uh, immediate action, your, your most critical assets. And for the water mains, that was Pine Street, Main Street, Center Street, Dockside, and Central Avenue. and. Uh, be seeing those in the CIP uh, that Dave puts forward. Life cycle cost, we looked at, based on the age and material and values in the literature, what the expected life is of every asset that's in that inventory, and when it's expected to need to be replaced. And so these are replacement costs in today's dollars. And uh, the total life cycle cost of, that we determined is $121 million over 120 years. 
So it's a significant investment that you have in, into just the water system. And that's just what's existing, just to maintain your current level of service, replace what's already in the ground uh, with similar materials and, uh, and pipe sizes, capacity. This doesn't include extensions or improvements. Just gives you an idea of how that life cycle cost is broken out over time. Each column is a decade going forward. I'm not sure if you can see 2L starts with 2010. The largest bump happens at 2070 going forward. Those were those water mains where the bulk of the distribution system was constructed. Um, the light blue is, is water main and that's obviously your biggest investment. And then you can see some recurring costs for the tanks and treatment facilities. So if you take that and you see that the large bump starts out in 2070, you could consider this in two periods, the first 60 years where the funding needs are lower uh, at about half a million dollars a year, and then a second 60 year period of one and a half million dollars per year, again in today's dollars. Or taking the entire life cycle as one whole, that's about a million dollars per year needed to be invested or saved for future projects each year for 120 years. And having several workshops with the staff, um, with Dave, going over some ideas how this could be done. So parts of the management plan are already funded under the current budget. A lot of the preventive maintenance of equipment and uh, regular replacements is already budgeted. One thing we recommend is establishing a capital reserve fund specifically for the water system and then uh, funding that that prod, um, excuse me funding that from balances surpluses in the budget over time uh, near term projects could be accomplished with the water department fund balance there is a fund balance I think it's about a million dollars right now um, while some of the debt service is being paid off. And then as the debt, sur debt falls off, that could be made up into the capital reserve fund to fund the plan. And some of the major projects could either be delayed or bonded, and there are always opportunities to reduce the costs. Uh, what we do here is just apply standard engineering judgment. So obviously through some value engineering use of town, labor, and staff, there are ways to reduce some of those costs, too. So the recommendations, um, increase the water system budget as needed to fill the gap between what's being done now and uh, funding the needed replacement costs. Replace the critical assets that are identified in the plan, uh, and that we'll be developing a more formal 10-year CIP as part of the final report that will be issued. So again, that's the first next step. We have a draft report that uh, is being reviewed now by Dave and his staff, and we'll be finalizing that. Uh, we'll be incorporating the recommendations and the funding needs from this report in the water rate model that we're currently under contract to provide the town. Planning for the near term projects, as I mentioned, and then some public communication. I think it may come as a surprise to a lot of users how, what the value of the system is and how, how much it takes to provide water uh, and all of the, the services that are provided for public health, business, and fire protection. So we've provided this brochure, and the idea there would be to uh, distribute that maybe along with bills or the annual consumer confidence report, just to give the, the public an understanding of the work that the town has done to understand what you own and the commitments that uh, you're hopefully planning to make to maintain it. And uh, 
Yeah, most importantly, as I mentioned, we want this asset management program to be maintained. Uh, we've designed it so that it can be maintained by the town staff without a lot of input from consultants over time. It's a user-friendly Excel spreadsheet uh, so they can just make updates as work is done. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah. Um, I take it that, uh, that if we uh, follow your recommendation for the first half, we save everybody living right here saves a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> But if you integrate both plans, if I read it, read it correctly, uh, we save more money looking people that aren't even foreigners, not thinking of being born yet. The town itself lose, uh, saves more money, even though the people living now don't benefit. Is that about right? Yes, it's a long-term plan. Words, I think the long-term would require, I mean, I would probably, on my own, speaking for myself, be a long-term thinker. You know, like building the pyramids is long-term or something. But not everybody in town feels that way. So it's something that, and I don't know whether short term or long, uh, your first half is better than half and half or the whole thing. The whole thing looked like a little better up there, uh, but it, I think it would require some education to tell the people what it was, and why they should pay a little more now, uh, because people uh, 50 or 100 years from now will be saving money. But I think it's a very nice presentation. I learned a lot. Thank you. Well, the one thing we did struggle with, and when you realize the need at a million dollars a year, and right now if we, we are funding our capital outlay at 120000 a year, within our operations budgets, we have uh, probably ten to uh, 15000 distribution and, and about 20000 in, in the operation, uh, the treatment plan budget, to do certain things up there. But what we have been, you know, what we want to do is, and, and because of all the uh, investments we've made over the last 30 years, if you look at our debt schedule, we are paying 790000 a year for, for uh, principal interest on bond payments. But in 10 years from now, we'll be at 79000 So as that's declining, as our bonds mm -hmm. falling off, uh, the plan would be to, to, to set up a capital reserve account and hold the rates as they are now, but as, they, as, the, as the, the debt service drops, use that money to fund the capital reserve and then to try to pick off some smaller projects in the next short few years and then look at uh, the potential going out. Uh, and, and right now, while some of our assets are over 120 years old, which is by their useful life, uh, they still are surviving. So when we talk about North Main Street and South Main Street, that's part of our original system. It's eight inch uh, cast iron main put in the 1890s. Uh, but it's still working uh, and we flush it properly and we haven't had uh, a significant amount of uh, problems with it. So we're extending its useful life. So I think what's very important about this plan and about all our assets is just, whoa, look what you own and look what you need to do. So um, it's, it's not a critical point now. We're not having a lot of breaks and we don't have to start, you know, but I think it's something now to stop planning, but 10 years from now is good, good planning. So I think that's why this is a, an excellent report. Uh, there's a lot of detail that goes behind that, so the reports will be finalized and we can get copies to you which shows each of the assets and, and how we came up with all the numbers. But this chart here really does graphically, by decade, show you where it is and what some of the assets are. One of the assets, which is difficult to see, but in, in, in 2020, uh, there's a kind of a grayish area that's in the middle, and then you see that occurring every 30 years. Mm -hmm. That's our, our uh, seasonal water lines. We have seven miles of seasonal water lines that service only 200 customers. Most of those lines are above ground, they're black plastic, and they are very um, susceptible. Uh, DES has said we've got to do something about securing those. Uh, a while ago, I came in here talked about potentially discontinuing those. Mm -hmm. And because we really can't charge enough money to pay those, so the rest of the system is supplementing those summer users, and those are basic seasonal lines. Uh, so that's a discussion I think we have to have, because if we can eliminate those, then there's a good chunk of money every 30 years that we don't have to replace those lines. When you say eliminate them, are you saying to put <clears throat> new lines in, or those people need wells? I would, uh, be, I, because of the, the density we serve, I don't see it being practical for us to expand the water system out to some of these areas uh, because most of the people are on wells or, uh, and that's what we would be looking. Give them a certain time, say within three or five years, you have to get a different water source because we're gonna discontinue this. Instead of us you know, planning on replacing this in 10 years, I think that's something we should discuss and then give everyone a uh, heads up that they would have to be, because some of these lines go thousands of feet and only service a couple of houses. 
and mm -hmm. it's really, uh, it's not a good system. Uh, we started doing it years ago to help out with camps, and it kind of got out of control, and now we have uh, major um, maintenance issues and, and headaches, because that's a lot of our, our water leaks come from those lines because they're not as secure. And that's just one aspect. The other aspect is also doing good preventative maintenance. Uh, like you see at the water plant, when we go up there, you see it still looks new after 20 years, and that's what we want to continue to do is if we can take care of uh, our equipment and try to uh, watch the critical stuff, we can hopefully delay some of this. So uh, we want to not do it because our head's in the ground. We're doing it with our head wide open and understanding where our, our criticality is and making sure the critical pieces are taken care of, or that we have backup systems, but also by preventive maintenance trying to extend their useful life. And I think that's what this is shown based on a lot of assumptions and that's what this comes up. So I think we're going to continue working with it. And, and like you say, they have put it into a software and a spreadsheet that we plan on updating. So every year when we do capital projects, we can then put it into this model, show the useful life has been extended because we did a preventative maintenance or because it's been replaced, uh, we'll put that in. So I think uh, going forward, it's, it's going to be a, a useful tool. And again, like we talked about earlier, we'll be doing it for the sewer system and sewer plant and for the roads also. Um, and, um, and for our buildings, and it, it's, yep. it's a little scary because, oh my God, you have so much. Uh, but, uh, and I think this is what the, the whole country is going uh, for. The problem we look at when you talk about the, the country's infrastructure and grading out as a D minus, it's mostly because <clears throat> we just are putting band-aids on things. We're not planning for the future. And I think, at least here at Wolfboro, we, we're, we're starting to plan. I think we have some good bones. Our system is pretty strong. Our plant is very good. And again, most importantly, we have really good staff that's kind of taking care of it. So we're, we can respond to emergencies and, 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 and knock on wood. We haven't had that in many of them. But I think it's important. And, and going forward, we want to make sure everyone understood. And again, any questions about the presentation? Or? Well, I, I'm assuming that what we have is a pretty simple computer program for our asset management. I was with you one time where we had these companies coming in with these big uh, programs that were costing, you know, hundred thousand dollars and so I'm assuming these are coming in on, on a spreadsheet Excel on spreadsheet. a rate Excel spreadsheet okay all, yep, yep. okay there's, there's still uh, a potential when we show you the sewer system so to connect the, um, the asset inventory to the field you could use your GIS so we are still looking at that and that's what Wooden Current is doing so that you could have a tablet in the field yeah. in which you could uh, click onto an asset it would it would come up and give you the last time you worked on it and if you're doing a work order, you could then input it. So you say, okay, okay I rebuilt this pump. You would have it uh, 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 time stamped when you did So we're still looking at those options. And, and some of that software would cost more money. Yeah. But Underwood has come up with a system that is, is uh, what I like because it it's not complicated. We didn't have okay. to buy any software. Okay. It doesn't mean in the future we may not upgrade uh, to something to help with the record keeping. But right now, I think we're in good shape. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. And the brochure, like you say, if you like that, we'll, uh, we're going to finalize that, and that, that will be uh, out. So that kind of is a good uh, summary, and we'll also get that posted to our webpage, which kind of gives you the, you know, the basics of the asset management plan and also why, uh, you know, your water bill costs so much, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, the other thing, too, I want to follow up. We are doing a detailed rate study this year, yep. so for, and, and uh, so uh, Keith Pratt will be in. Um, I forget when we're trying to schedule for it, but in the summertime, in which we'll be looking at both water and sewer rates and looking at the long-term plan and, and how we could, um, the, this, the, the idea of uh, setting up a capital reserve account and then funding it uh, with these projects going forward. So we'll have that. And then hopefully my goal still is not to have any rate increases in the next few years, but at some point we might will have to have some rate increases. Is he going to do some work on the hydrant fee and get more backup information on that? Um, we will which be, I think we need. We'll be prepared to discuss the hydrant fees and the impact that the budget committee had by cutting it, and then also how that plays out in a long-term plan, and also why we have those, uh, why we have hydrant fees. And, and I know that the, the uh, it's a discussion we have every year, so we will be ready and prime for that. Okay. Thank you. Good. All set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Next, we have uh, old business. Any other business? Town manager's report. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a few things here I'd like to report out. Uh, first, the uh, Lakes Region Planning Commission is having their annual meeting on Monday, June 26th. And Governor Sununu, I got it. Oh. 
Governor Sununu is anticipated to be the uh, keynote speaker, and uh, so I, I want to see. Uh, I want it's going to be right here in Wolfboro at the Wolfboro Inn. That's right. Um, fact is, I, I, I lent them the uh, uh, image that was on the front of our town report to put on their invitation. So it's uh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, I wanted to see who. who who amongst you might be interested in attending that so we could get you registered? It's uh, June 26th. Let me just look here. I'd be interested. Let me just check the date. Okay. I'll be in Baltimore. Okay, you can just let me know if you're interested and get you signed up. It usually is. June 26th? June 26th. On Monday. Yeah. Get back to you. Okay, very good. Um, our electric department has hired a new e electric lineman. Um, they had a very good response uh, to their um, recruitment effort. Uh, they had seven qualified uh, uh, applicants uh, that they, they interviewed, and uh, uh, the gentleman that was hired is coming to us from, uh, his name is Shane Pelletier. He's coming to us from Bucksport, Maine. So that's uh, so we're we're at full complement again on the uh, linemen in the electric department. Uh, I received a, a check uh, just today from the trustees of the Josiah W. Brown Trust in the amount of twenty thousand dollars. So uh, we're refunded and ready to go with the next round of applicants for these Josiah Brown scholarships. Uh, the clock faces, uh, you may have noticed, uh, have disappeared from the uh, town hall uh, and they were taken to the contractor's uh, workshop. He will re-guild them. And uh, there's been some work going on the last couple of days, you may have noticed, with the lift. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, uh, they told us that uh, uh, there was some repainting and some other minor work that needed to be done up there. And we've, we figured what better time than now, you got the lift here, go, go, let's, let's get it done while we can. So uh, that's what's going on there. Um, also, I noticed that the lights were not positioned so they were down on the clock, and when they put the ha hands and everything back, we we'll, we check to make sure that the lights are reflecting correctly on the clock. Okay, we'll do. Uh, the town of Moultonboro uh, has notified uh, uh, me that the uh, their next meeting of the Upper Lakes Board of Selectmen group meetings uh, will be at, on Tuesday, June 6th at the Moulton Borough Town Hall. I wanted to see if any, any of you were available to attend that meeting. I am. I am. So Dave and Linda. Perfect. Okay, I'll notify them that you will be coming. It's at 6.30 p.m. at the Moulton Borough Town Hall, June 6th. He can hear you right now. Yeah, I'm, I'll go too. I'm going to go too. Okay. To that. And Luke, all three of you? Okay. June 6th. Okay. I think that's everything on my, my list here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, committee reports. Brad? Yeah, uh, last night we had a planning board meeting. Um, well, the public hearing was we had the finalized to give the approval for Goodyear and Hawkins for their new showroom to be built. And we had to end up with a workshop after that, which we had a discussion on the, uh, the lodging forum that we had held about uh, a month ago and also talking about our master plan, getting ready to kick off our, uh, our committee groups on, on that to start that process. So that was it for me. Oh, and we have a uh, Friends of Libby meeting tomorrow night. If nothing for me. Oh, you went no. to the Water Summit. Oh. 
I did do that, <laughs> yes. I, only reason that I went to that water summit, so I know he, sh he was there. Um, I w went to the chamber executive board meeting. I'll leave the report on the EDC to Dave Bowers, but I went there as the alternate. Um, I went to the DOC committee, um, a committee meeting, and we were not able to get a quorum, so we weren't able to uh, make any decisions, but the committee is going to meet in the next week and hopefully get something back to the board uh, shortly. Um, and that's what I have. Thank you. If um, I went to the EDC meeting, as Linda mentioned, uh, the EDC meetings are much more meaty now than they were, let's say, five years ago or more. Uh, they're about an hour and a half. Uh, many topics are discussed. There's been some, uh, quite a bit of uh, discussion back and forth and whether Wolfboro should have a hotel uh, that is uh, accommodates more than 35 people, which I think Wolfboro Inn does. And there's a, one faction that says we should have a, a hotel that occupies that uh, has maybe 80 or 85 people minimum. In order, that seems to be the minimum for a hotel to be profitable. Uh, we have no facilities now for uh, having a conference here if somebody wants to have a conference. Uh, uh, we have lots of restaurants, we have lots of entertainment and so forth. Uh, and I don't have a, a particular comment on that except that uh, uh, you have one faction that says we're just fine. If it ain't uh, broke, don't fix it. Uh, we have bed and breakfast and things. Another says we will do a lot if we could have a uh, hotel come in. And then, then it was brought up that uh, we don't want a chain hotel. And then someone said, well, the one we have is a chain hotel. It's Hay Creek. We have lots of franchises in town. We have Dunkin' du Dunk Donuts and various different things. Uh, so uh, discussion back and forth. And then the second main thing talked about was that in addition to having Wolfboro be the oldest summer resort and the Jewel of Lake Winnipesaukee, uh, the EDC wants to emphasize Museums. Uh, we are the we have more museum. We are the third best endowed museum town in the state of New Hampshire, and uh, these are attractions. We have the Railroad Museum, the Railroad Model Railroad Museum, incipient, which may or may not occur if they raise the money. And we have the Boat Museum, which is being apparently being well financed. Uh, that'll be on Bay Street, and that'll be a large attraction. We have the Wright Museum, the Libby Museum is a. Uh, expanding and has a new program as we heard earlier today uh, and the Wolfboro uh, Historical Society which I am a, a, one of my pet groups I think it could do a lot more but I was heartened to see that they have some programs this year that they didn't have but one problem is they're open not open too much but anyway the idea of having uh, Wolfboro be a museum city in addition to the uh, that's more year-round and that's being discussed Thanks, Dave. Uh, I've had no meetings. I have a meeting tomorrow night. The chief and I have a police commission meeting uh, tomorrow evening. So I'll report the next meeting about that. Uh, public input? I mean, sorry, questions from the press? Press? Public input. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jonathan Hopewell. I live on Jenis Farm Road. It's one of the East Wolfboro Roads with a scenic des designation and extremely low volume of traffic. It's unfortunate Dave has left. Um, I would like to quickly address the importance of management and oversight for scenic roadways. Our roadways are designated as scenic for a reason. Trying to make the road fit into a class, this doesn't work for this kind of road, which has extremely low volume. I'm not going to quote RSAs. Uh, there are many more than Dave def defined, nor the RSAs that have been abused in the past year. I'm merely requesting that the board use common sense when planning for work on delicate scenic roadways. These roads should be managed differently. For example, Mr. Ford states in his memorandum, the trees along the roadsides will be marked for removal depending on how many times it's been hit by the plow. This seems ludicrous. Here you have a scenic road, and the first thing to do is remove scenic trees to accommodate the wing of the plow that caused the damage, thus further destroying the scenic beauty. 
I hope the board will review these plans and realize that once scenic roads are damaged, it is scarred permanently. Finally, I would like to urge all members of the selectmen to visit East and North Wolfboro Roads and judge the roads for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, visiting these roads, by the way, is a very enjoyable experience. Uh, I rec recommend it highly. You can go up Haynes Hill Road and uh, branch left, right, and sideways. And then probably in about an hour, you can cover almost everything by going slowly. Genesis is a little bit out of the way, but it's, uh, it's easy enough to find the map. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne Ryan, Scenic Road, Stoneham Road. Um, I have here for the board um, <clears throat> the Scenic Road designation as voted by Warren Article um, for Mr. Owen to give to um, Mr. Ford, Barry Muscio, and Matt Sullivan. I'll leave this with you, Mr. Owen, after the meeting. Um, it's a record of accuracy. Um, I also left with the board a packet that I would hope that in the next couple of weeks you'd uh, go through, and um, some of the comments have been addressed and some haven't. I think that a stronger emphasis needs to be placed on the scenic roads, even though I heard uh, some mention of that tonight. Uh, <clears throat> the master plan uh, spells out very clearly uh, uh, what the uh, the role of a designated scenic road is, and in, in, in it says to be treated with care. You go on further and there's a goal section under roads, and I worked on this section of the master plan. <clears throat> and it's uh, implement an annual road inventory, a road surface management system. And our last uh, update was 2013, and Mr. Ford said there are some concerns with that. My question is, are we using it? And um, um, also, um, are we using it, but have we determined what methodology we want? Because a road surface management plan has different ways to determine your method of maintenance. And it's up to the Board of Selectmen and Mr. Ford to determine whether they want to do worst first, most traveled. Um, there's a, a whole host of ways to go about it. And then um, the master plan says, implement a road trenching regulation that includes cutting, ditching, and patching standards. I doubt that we have that. Designate a master plan, um, uh, the scenic road. I've got that to hand out. And then when I was digging through my stuff that I never threw away, which I should have, um, I found Exhibit E. And Exhibit E was interesting in so much as that it's the Vermont State Standard uh, design standards, and um, this is what we use when we w were writing up the master plan. And then Exhibit G was used for the master plan also, and it's a policy on design highways and streets, and um, it's a universal American standard, and it, it based um, on uh, cars per day and topography. And I know almost every deliberative session I ask Mr. Ford, um, how much do we spend per mile and how do you, what methodology do you use? Are you doing worse first? Whoever, whoever complains the loudest? Have you done a traffic count? And I get a very vague response. And when I talk about traffic count, he looks at me like I have three heads. Um, but it's important to designate the traffic volume, and it should be um, a, a specific number and um, cars per day or whatever. Usually the, design, uh, usually the design standards are for 20 years, so I'm asking that you think in that term, that you go out a little bit longer, and then attached to this also is some other standards. Um, and the master plan goes on with their recommendations to say, preserve trees and other scenic features which make Wolfboro particularly attractive. Avoid widening existing town highways. Continue to implement the state standard 
and the town scenic road policy. I don't think we have a town road scenic policy. Consider strengthening the standards um, for preservation of existing rural environment and then the uh, goal, the town has a rural character that enhances our economic viability and quality of life that should be maintained by designating additional scenic roads. And then it says inventory town roads, culverts, bridges, prioritize the reconstruction and maintenance administrative method, which I hear talking about hiring an outside firm. I believe this last one, the 2013, was done in conjunction with an engineering firm, but the 2010 was done by UNH, and then I know other towns have used UNH and their regional planning commission. So there is a, a way of doing it that's not super expensive. Um, and then it talks about, the master plan talked about future projection of road expansion in logical form with an overlay map. I don't think I've seen an overlay map. So that's that, and um, then I have um, establishing a methodology, I've attached that. I've attached the Regional Planning Commission methodology, and it, it goes on to say that, and there's some American association that talks about it. It says, um, every dollar spent to keep a road in good condition avoids six to fourteen dollars needed later to rebuild the same road once it has deteriorated significantly. Investing too little on a road repairs increases the future liabilities. And um, Stoneham Road is a classic of that. We had it redone in 2014. I uh, left an attachment for you, and um, a segment of it was done. I think people were had the impression that the whole length of Solnham Road was going to be done from the town line to to the dead end, and it wasn't. It was only from um, Cotton Mountain Road to Dallas Road, and I don't know if my figure is correct, but it was many, many, many thousands of dollars, and it's a mess and it hasn't lasted because a penny, uh, what do they call it, um, penny wise and pound foolish. So there are roads that really need to be completely reconstructed. And then I've left for you the UNH unpaved roads, how they should be handled, and also the unpaved roads, oh, that's a separate copy. Um, I'm trying to go fast. Um, the last thing I would like to just say quickly is um, in the response to the 42717 Granite State News article where a, uh, a young woman came in and addressed this situation, I'd like to add to that that um, taxation without representation, she's exactly right. And I know that we had discussed years back about going to a June um, town meeting schedule, and the difficulty with that is the first year you have to budget for 18 months. Well, I think that we have a finance director and a budget committee and selectmen that are capable of doing that, and I agree that, that it is taxation without representation. Um, and the second point was that um, uh, it was mentioned about roads that are indexed 70 or above. Um, I counted approximately 40, and I used that same chart that David held up. I counted approximately 42 roads below 70 and 270 roads above the 70% category, but he did mention there was mistakes in that, so I don't know what those mistakes were. Um, um, but also the 2013 inventory that he had did not include dirt roads. The 2010 did. And um, outside engineer, no, we can do it locally. Update the um, road surface management plan policy for 20 years. Use it and select a meth uh, methodology, whatever you all agree on. Select it, do it, stick to it. 
don't do hodgepodge here and there and try to be penny wise, pound foolish. Uh, and Mr. Harriman, you were correct when you said do it right the first time. Initially, uh, it costs more, but the maintenance is less in the long run. And the last point I would make is hopefully constructive. Um, I would request that the Board of Selectmen establish in 2018 a town warrant article for a special capital reserve account specifically for major road reconstruction and that would be like the base and pavement replacement versus a rehabilitation. Start a good size capital reserve for major road construction. So we're building that up and when you've got a road like North Wolfboro Road or whatever road you want to pick or whatever, whatever solution you want, but get that capital reserve in place and I think it would go a long way to helping out uh, uh, and, and, and don't lump it in the pot with all the other road maintenance. Keep it specific and separate, however you would determine. And I'd like to ask for a follow-up meeting if we could. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, I have a couple of comments. First of all, taxation without representation. You can't vote in Massachusetts and also vote in New I, I'm New having Hampshire. trouble hearing you, I'm sorry. Uh, but you, and I think anybody from Massachusetts can easily uh, be a, see what's going on here. I don't think it's feasible to move the town meeting. I own property in, uh, a number of property in some places. Uh, I have an island in, in Alton, I get paid taxes, I have no representation, but that's the American way. If you live in Washington, D.C., you can't vote. Uh, secondly, I think the, the, this, uh, I see the Rossingers are here. And I love the town roads. I've made that very clear over the years. I think this is something the selectmen cannot vote on and say, well, we're going to put up seeing highway signs. We're going to do this. I think it's something that probably a uh, committee should be made up with recommendations of stakeholders uh, with practicalities added by Dave uh, Ford and anyone else interested. And we have lots of time between now and the budget. Uh, if you, you, I don't know if you were here last meeting, but there was a lady from Key Waden Road. We, did you, were you here? She gave a very good presentation on why we should have a bond article. You know, she's uh, an extremely erudite presentation. So, but I don't, uh, I think that this is something that maybe the chair, or the, BO, the board of selectmen can have a committee. And secondly, I think from the conversations tonight, this is something the board could do. Uh, it seems to me that one plow serves all purposes, and if a big wing plow is hitting trees and everything and, and dirt roads, it would seem to me it would make lots of sense for the uh, Public Works Department to have a smaller plow without wings or smaller wings or something that doesn't hit trees. Uh, that would be, a, in my opinion, a no-brainer. End of comment. Me? Well, that was quite a plateful, but I would say that um, I don't think we should be bonding um, major projects for rehabilitation of road millions. Um, we've got a debt that's quite substantial already that we have to pay off until we're all dead. And um, the way to do it uh, prudently would be to do a capital reserve. Um, I. Uh, as far as a June meeting, um, that's up to you to decide. It's something that's very doable if you want to do it. If you don't, no skin off my nose. I pay my taxes anyway. I just think uh, it would be fair. <laughs> it would be fair to everybody that pays taxes in this town. And the third thing I didn't get, so that's fine. We'll see you hopefully in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Virginia Taylor, I live on Stoddard Road, and yes, the Rossigers are here. They're my neighbors. We're all going to talk about the same thing. But basically, I want to show you pictures of my property. As it, uh, I own the point there uh, called Cross Corner, Stoddard Road and Bickford Road. Um, this top one, I put on top especially because Mr. Ford mentioned how the water turnouts are the old ones that are used. This one was created by the town last fall on my property. Thank you. And 
I also have to say it's a little nerve-wracking to stand up here. <laughs> just want you to know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that shows you the road, both roads, the, the erosion, the walls that are falling in. There are a couple of utility poles that are also being compromised. You can see tree roots. Uh, the road is, it, it does in fact get graded every year, but it is eroding constantly. Those pictures were taken in the fall, before this winter. So um, you can imagine what it's like now. It's on both sides of my property. And to, to Mr. Port's credit, he has come out and looked. So did Scott Pike before him twice. So they both, they all, they both said that in the spring they would get, get to this and fix the problems that they've created. Um, and this is the third spring now that I've seen nothing. So I'm a little concerned about it. I will also say, uh, to the credit of the highway department, that the road, my road, Stoddard Road, is much better, the surface is much better than in years past. I mean, there were times when I couldn't, I wondered if I'd make it up to my driveway because the mud was so bad. We don't have that problem anymore. But it is a nasty problem, and I'm losing, I think I have lost, actually, about eight feet on both sides of my property for 400 feet of the point. And I don't know what that relates to in tax property, tax value, but, but I didn't see a reduction in that, I'm just saying. So that's all I really wanted to say. I want you to look at the pictures, uh, take a good look. Um, Mr. Ford says he'll fix it, but as I said, I haven't seen anything yet. I'm on the, I, I too live on the scenic road. I, I moved there just like Linda said, for a purpose. I don't expect to have two and three and four um, ambulances and fire engines going up and down my road quickly, 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 like they might be able to get downtown. I don't expect that. I understood that when I moved there. Um, I understand that there's dust. I understand, oh, here's another thing, traffic. Before they widened Stoddard Road, which is what's causing the erosion on my property, um, traffic was, yes, it's, yes, it's a cut through. Um, College Road over to 28. I sat on my porch this afternoon in the sunshine and counted in a 17 minute period 22 cars and trucks that went by. I didn't move to that road so that it could be widened so I'd have 22 cars and trucks go by in a 17 minute period. So when he says he wants to ride in the road, uh, he also said to, to me at one time, well why don't you just give up a little bit of land, you have plenty. Well, you know, I don't want to give up any more of my land. I've given enough. And I'd like to actually have it back. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. What your photo? Right there. You are, thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? late and I shall be succinct. Claude Russiger speaking for the Society for the Preservation of Rural Wolfboro. I will hand out to you uh, files that we have prepared. They're very brief and I will summarize now taking little more than three minutes uh, our thoughts. After the April 6th meeting, Mr. Harriman and I exchanged a word in which he said something that I thought was compelling. He said it really all begins with a philosophy. We think it does. And a philosophy is a vision. How the residents in a neighborhood want their roads and how to achieve the residents' objectives. And yesterday, I went to one of my favorite county roads. Mr. Harriman knows it's the Effingham Road, and I will just pass this through. It's a very pretty road. I would encourage anyone interested in this whole topic, go to the Effingham Road, look at it. It's pretty, it's attractive, it speaks to rural New Hampshire, 
So. Where's this? Effingham Road. Okay. Now, what is this about? It's about our neighborhoods. It's about the character of where we live. It's about our community. It's about our property values, because the roads now <coughs> look a shambles. So it's about all of those. And it's the residents who should have the major input of how they want their neighborhood to be. What is the need to come to the chase on this? <coughs> it's a management issue. The need is for a protocol for the roads, a protocol for the gravel roads, a protocol for other roads. And no, it doesn't need an expensive outside expert. We can write that protocol. I was happy to hear the suggestion. Actually, I've heard great suggestions from the board tonight. I was happy to hear the suggestion of a committee can be put together of residents who are interested to make a report to the Board of Selectmen by the end of this year that does a overview assessment. Just a statement. This is what we see and this is what we find. No more than that. But people of good faith can do that. And they can do it free of charge. Then we can act. So the need, a protocol. And the protocol is something that has to be mutually agreed. The residents drive what they want. The Board of Selectmen representing them gives the instruction. And town officials execute. I noted in Mr. Ford's memo, you might have seen the same, the interesting view that he would not address opinions with which he disagrees. Well, it's a, an approach, but I'm not sure it's the right approach. I think that to get to the best outcome, you have to hear different opinions. So in all this, where is the respect for the residents, the taxpayers? That's where it begins. Now. There's a problem that has to be addressed. I'm going to hand this out, and I'm not going to belabor it. I've done it in the past, and we've heard comment tonight about the same thing. There are RSAs that have not been respected. For example, the alteration of roads, which widening is, must have voter approval or Board of Selectmen approval. The Public Works Department took it upon itself to widen the scenic roads of Wolfboro with no authorization. It violates the RSA. It is not true that the Scenic Road Ordinance, and I cite you a Supreme, New Hampshire Supreme Court case that clarifies the issue, it is not true that it is limited to 15-inch trees and stone walls. That is the letter of the law. There is a spirit of the law which is integral to the law and the New Hampshire Supreme Court ruled on this, that says that the spirit of the law, the intent, the maintenance of the traditional character is as much a part of the law as the letter of the law. Unfortunately, we have often heard it repeated that the only thing the Scenic Road Ordinance says is trees and stone walls. That is not true. And I'm not going to read this to you. It's late at night, and you can see it for yourselves. But I have reproduced it. The solution, as we said, we can begin not with expert opinion. We can begin by a constituted small committee, residents, citizens, to put together a good faith report of what they see. This is an issue that matters. It matters to our to the people who live in these areas, it matters to the community. 80% of Wolfboro is rural. So it matters to the entire community and what our community will look like. The method, fairly simple. We've already discussed the committee, which was brought up here by yourselves this evening. The protocol. Protocol is a definition of how we want these roads to look. And one thing I would ask you, which concerned me tonight. Mr. Ford said that they had certain works that they would do on certain roads. 
this year. It would be, I think, advisable if that work, except for routine maintenance, routine maintenance is fine, would be held off until we have a chance to put this together. Just as uh, you wisely, I think, preferred to hold off on the downtown work to get it right. It's the same thing. Once it's done wrong, it's very hard to turn it back. So if you could give that instruction, I think that would be very much appreciated and very beneficial, and allow the time to get it right, get it defined properly. I also heard, uh, I think it was yourself, Mr. Freudenberg, who suggested that perhaps Mr. Pike or somebody in that capacity, I don't put a name on it, but we know that right now it would be Mr. Pike, be designated as the person responsible. We think that's a very good idea. The public works task is a very large task. We acknowledge that. Mr. Ford has a lot on his shoulders. The roads are important enough, large enough a part of our budget, large enough to our community, to designate someone as a supervisor who is to attend to the roads. So we're very much in favor of that. Um, and finally, the mechanism was provided for. I don't think anyone who attended the April 6th meeting did not understand that we were promised a follow-up technical meeting that would not be any grandstanding or speeches and so forth. It would be discussion of technical points. We have done, as a society, a great deal of research. I'm not going to share it with you tonight because you don't want to hear it right now. But we have done a lot of work. Even this morning, I spoke with an engineer in the Midwest from a firm with uh, road things. We have things to contribute. It should be part of the discussion, and the residents should be able to bring that forth. So, bottom line, we live in a prosperous community by any standard. And the residents, the taxpayers, have a right to decent, attractive roads for their tax money. They have a right to have their views considered and heard and then implemented. Because who really governs a town as Wolfboro? The residents. Yourselves as the representatives and then over to the employees. So that's what I have to say. I'm not going to waste or take say waste. Take more of your time. I will hand out these. Thank you. Summarize these thoughts. You will see in the back we found some things about how to stabilize, uh, for instance, this whale found in the state of Maine, a protocol for construction, which is something Something that's been long discussed, which is that the grade on a lot of these roads is very low. It's got to be brought up. And by the way, we acknowledge budgets. We acknowledge all of that. We think that immediate steps that cost no more money than would be spent could significantly improve what we have now. It's all the issues that have been raised, and I won't take the time tonight but we would appreciate being able to address Thank this. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I, think, you know, I think a committee should be set up to a committee of individuals to deal with. Well, could I comment? Uh, yeah. The intent, I believe, was that there was going to be a follow-up meeting yes. uh, to tonight, uh, the, whatever you want to call it, a tactical meeting or whatever, uh, that Mr. Ford was going to make his recommendations here tonight, and then that would lead to a, a follow-up meeting again with with the stakeholders, yep. uh, was my understanding. Yep. My understanding as well. Yeah. Well, David made some remarks about something next meeting, didn't he? Yeah, but I, I think this needs to be a separate meeting yep. that can concentrate on the roads Just issue that. and not, yep. not have 20 other agenda items. Yep. Correct. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We do have some people on staff here who are uh, up at the office with that no roads in construction. You know. we, we do indeed. We do indeed.
Is there anyone else like to speak? Okay, I entertain a motion to uh, so go to public. Make a motion we went to non public. I think you're. That was yeah. Yes. Motion to remain seconded. Uh, all in favor? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. yes.